One second, guys. One second. All right, guys, let's get started. If everyone can have a seat, please, when we get started. I'd like to call to order a regular city council meeting. The date is April 17th. The time is 8.06 p.m. Madam Clerk, roll call. Mayor. Here. Chairperson Douglas Lawson. Here. Chair Pro Tem Chadrick McCoy. Councilperson Kashava Miller Anderson. Present. Councilperson Shirley Lanier. Here. Councilperson Glenn Spiritus. Here. City Manager Jonathan Evans. Present. Acting City Clerk Deborah Hall McCullen is present. City Attorney Don Wynn. Here. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Mr. Chairperson Lawson and City Council Board members, please let the record reflect that Chair Pro Tem McCoy sent notification of his absence from tonight's City Council meeting. Thank you, Madam Clerk. You're welcome. I'm not sure. Is my student still here tonight? All right, so our students left for the night. So we're going to have a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Dr. Glenn Spiritus. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible. With liberty and justice for all. Do we have any additions, deletions, or substitutions to the agenda? None from staff, Mr. Chair. Thank you. From the board? Board members, if I can look, uh, item 11A, I had some questions in my agenda review, but staff was able to send over some information from HR. If we can move that to consent, if we're okay? That's fine. 11A, it's resolution 5424, move to consent. You okay with that board? Okay. All right, so we're gonna leave it in its regular place. Additional uh, additions, deletions? Disclosures by the board? Mr. Chair. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Spinner. Just want to disclose that I'm a former member of the city's uh, housing authority. Thank you, Dr. Spinner. Any additional uh, disclosures? Motion to adopt. So moved. Second. Motion been made and properly seconded. Madam Clerk. Councilperson Miller Anderson. Yes. Councilperson Spiritus. Yes. Councilperson Lanier. Yes. Chair Lawson. Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you. Moving directly into our consent agenda. All matters listed under this are considered routine action. Take one motion. There's no separate discussion of these items unless a councilperson so request. In the event, items removed from the general order of business and consider its normal sequence on the agenda. Does anyone want to move any item from consent? Do we have any public comments for consent? Chair Lawson, we do not have any public comment cards on consent. Thank you. Motion to adopt consent. Second. 
Motion be made and properly seconded. Madam Clerk. Councilperson Lanier. Yes. Councilperson Spiritus. Yes. Councilperson Miller Anderson. Yes. Chair Lawson. Yes. Unanimous vote. Moving into our regular uh, action, we're going to go straight into our public comments. Mr. Chair, we do have 12 public comment cards. The acceptance of public comment cards for general comments is now closed. Thank you. I'm going to read the disclosure. Public comment shall begin at 7.30 unless otherwise there's no further business of city council in which the event shall begin sooner. In addition, if an item is being considered at 7.30, then the comments from the public shall begin immediately after. This board has adopted rules of decorum. Please govern yourselves accordingly. Madam Clerk. The first speaker will be Erica Davis, followed by Anaya Shannery, and then Andrew Gianta. Welcome, Ms. Davis. Hello. Erica Davis, Riviera Beach. What just happened in the last meeting was ridiculous. This is why we can't get things done. I mean, how many times are we going to keep doing this over and over again? That was uncalled for. If the water situation is under investigation, let it be. Why do we have to waste 15 and 20 minutes discussing something so petty as that? I mean, we have real serious business here. We don't want to be here till 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning over this pettiness and childish little play in the sandbox foolishness that you have going on all the time. I mean, it's just crazy. What is wrong with you all? Get it together, man. We're tired of this. We are almost at the end. We are exhausted of this petty, crazy, stupid stuff that's always going on. If it's under investigation, let it be. That's all I have to say. Thank you for comments, Ms. Davis. Next is Anaya Shinnery, Andrew Gianta, and Angelo Dariano. Hello. I just wanted to really come on here and introduce myself. I came during the utility meeting, and hopefully we do find a resolution when for the water situation, because I do have kids, I have a baby, and she's only eight months, and bathing her in that is not sanitary. Um, but also, I am looking to do stuff for the community, so that's why I wanted to come out and just show face. Um, hopefully by July, just really doing something with the kids and just trying to bring it together just because we are so divided in a sense. So that's all. Thank and if, you. If you could just say your name for the record. Anaya. <laughs> Thank you for coming in that night. Thank you. Andrew Gianta, Angelo Dariano, and Verissa Das. Good evening. My name is Andrew Gianta. I'm a captain in the union representative here for Riviera Beach Fire Rescue, but most importantly, I'm a resident of the city. I'm the epitome of what it is to live, work, and play in Riviera Beach, along with a bunch of other employees who call this place home. Unfortunately, for many employees, Riviera Beach has not been an incredible place to work for as of recent. It isn't because of the long, sleepless hours running calls or being away from my family during holidays. It simply comes down to one department within the city that's ran by one man, and that's Randy Sherman. No matter the situation, Randy can simply say something and poof, that's the final word, without any explanation or numbers because he has none. I can speak for all employees when I say that paychecks are constantly wrong and finances are reluctant to fix them. I've been fighting for over a year just to get some of my employees' money back. The city even admitted that they underpaid the employee and still wouldn't pay them, all because Randy can't comprehend his own system. The same error caused our entire department to be short on money. He, they still didn't want to fix it until I had to file a class action grievance where an attorney had to rule in our favor just to get $20,000 back that was unpaid to my firefighters. This process took months and countless hours for myself and two incredible secretaries uh, in our fire administration. We had to fix finances audit probably five different times, and each time they just said, oops, sorry, our bad, but no accountability was ever met. Uh, due to fighting for months of this for what's right, finance filed an erroneous complaint against me, a clear setup and deliberate attack, and I encourage anybody to do a public records request for the recording once the investigation is done. This wasn't just an attack against me. This is an attack against all members of the union and any union within this city, an attack that will be investigated by the National Labor Relations Board. 
I even warned Mr. Evans a couple weeks before this attack that I was fear that somebody would try and blemish my career due to my position as a union rep and sticking up for what's right. The police have been out of contract for over a year and a half and have missed two raises. The firefighters are now under contract and missed a raise and are not receiving an insurance benefit because of lie after lie in a process that Randy's prolonged. He has destroyed the PMSA union and he seeks to do the same to the SEIU right now. This man lives to bring down all employees' livelihoods so they get desperate and agree to his asinine contract terms. This has caused the biggest morale dump citywide that I've seen in 11 years. We have police and firefighters leaving left and right for other places because they simply don't want to work here. This should infuriate the citizens. You're losing the best employees and being replaced by uh, low-level recruits and disgruntled uh, and completely worn down people who are working those positions. At some point, it's going to be a safety issue. I stand here today not only representing myself, but representing the city, the citizens, employees, and a hundred of empty positions that need filling in the city that nobody wants. Why? Why do these positions remain empty? Why does one person have so much power and control in the city? And why has he never been held accountable? This city and the residents deserve the best, and as long as Randy Sherman in that department has this much power, it'll never happen. A forensic audit should be done immediately to uncover any mishaps or wrongdoing by Randy. Thank you. Angelo Dariano, Verissa Das, followed by Michael Jordan. It's gonna be hard to follow that. My name is Angelo Dariano, I'm with Local 2928, um, the Firefighters Union, and I'm here today to shed some light on the negotiations that we've been experiencing. We first started in March, 20, March of 2023. So 14 months now we've been negotiating with uh, the city of Riviera Beach. Six months in our negotiations, we still have not received a, a proposal from the city. We were not making any headway. So we contacted manager Evans and let him know what was going on. And then he came to the table and sure enough, the first day he was there was the first day we actually had a proposal and we started negotiating. Um, so that's a nice thing to see. Um, we could not come to agreement to turn, uh, we could not agree to the terms of the financial costing. So we asked, how are you calculating this? We received a spreadsheet from Randy Sherman. It had 10, thousand lines or so actually it had tens of thousands of lines almost thirty six thousand different cells in that spreadsheet right and we found it riddled with errors there are errors all over the place we brought that back to the table and he admitted that there were errors in that spreadsheet multiple different errors calculations the way that we do the way that they uh, calculate everything um so manager Evans decided manager evans decided to bring the assistant county i'm sorry the assistant finance director in and she agreed with our cost calculations. She said, no, what you are doing is correct, right? So that clearly identified that, you know, um, Randy Sherman was, was making errors and your assistant finance director came in and, and confirmed that. Um, so from that point, we still try to continue to negotiate and we really have not come to any terms. And it seems like there's one person that keeps blocking our negotiations. And I'm gonna go back to Randy Sherman one more time. I don't understand, you know, how he has that much control. It seems that if he just says we can't afford it or the city can't afford it, he goes unchecked, unchallenged. That's until he met us. When we challenged him, right, we showed that, hey, there's are some issues in what you're doing. I don't understand if he's doing this maliciously or if he's just inept. Either way, it's not good. For the last nine and a half years, we have been we have brought this to Randy and brought it to the city that if you have a 28 day pay cycle, it's going to cost firefighter. It's going to cost the city more money. There's built in overtime. We've tried to push that pay cycle and change it for years now. We've continued and argued with Randy saying that there and he kept saying that there is no savings if we change the pay cycle. Well, guess what? When he gave us the 36,000 cells of information, we found the cost. It's two hundred and thirteen thousand dollars and eight hundred dollars per year. If that was fixed when we brought it to the attention of the city, Nine and a half years ago, that's $2 million more the city would have in their pocket. $2 million that the union is bringing forward. We have done everything that we possibly could to negotiate in good faith. We cannot move forward without addressing this issue. We have declared, we have declared impasse. So we will be going to the special magistrate hearing. We're very proud to go in that process. We've nego negotiated in good faith, and I don't understand why we cannot continue as an organization, both the city and, and us, to work out an agreement. Thank you, um, Cummins. Thank you very much. Marissa Das, Michael Jordan, followed by Cindy March. Welcome to us. Hello, everyone. I am Commissioner Verissa Laldas from the Port of Palm Beach. I just wanted to get the word out. We are doing a summer internship program, a paid internship program 
for um, students that are currently enrolled in for the fall of 2024 um, for uh, if they're enrolled in a trade school, a community college, or a university, um, and if they're, they're scheduled to be enrolled in the fall of February 2024, at this time, they can apply for our summer internship program. We are currently accepting resumes that can be found on the Port of Palm Beach website. And these students will have the opportunity to um, participate and intern in different programs related to accounting, marketing, uh, information technology, um, and various uh, administrative positions at the Port of Palm Beach. Uh, once again, it's $15 an hour. Um, you know, kids, if you're at home for the summer and, and you need a, a job and you're planning to be enrolled in a college, trade school, or community college in the fall of 2024, you are eligible to apply. And we hope that um, we will see some students from Riviera apply for this program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Doss. Michael Jordan, Cindy March, and Tiffany Williams. Welcome, Mr. Jordan. Hello, how's everybody doing? Uh, first of all, I would like to, as always, agree with the mayor concerning the way the uh, situation with the water was handled. It was a breakdown in the system of the way it should flow. And I think that needs to be checked and revamped to prevent any future things. I also agree with uh, Councilwoman Lanier that um, it actually shouldn't take this long to get an answer. And I know that, you know, it's like we're beating the dead horse. OK, but it's a serious issue. On top of that, I'm going to tell you what I see. I see big salaries. You know what I'm saying? When I'm saying big salaries, I'm talking about good pay. OK, not only that, we have people in big positions. We have the city manager and we have the utilities directors and still no answers. I still think that, you know, something has to be done about that. And I'm like I said, you know, with all due respect, it's time for some heads to get the rolling positions to become vacant that's making the big service and some seats to be filled. You know what I'm saying? And that's the, that's the only thing that I have to say. That's the only way we're going to be able to just really get it together. You know, we have to get the situation together. And I say that with all due respect to everybody, you know, and I say when you're right, I agree with you. And not only that, Miss Deborah, like I said, she still the, the acting interim for the uh, city clerk. I agree. I support her. I don't think she needs to be evaluated. The work she does speak for herself. So I don't know why we're still sitting there. I feel like she shouldn't even have to interview. Just slide her right into position. If she's good enough to be the acting intern for as long as she has been, then there should be no doubt about it. The job should be given to her. Thank you for your comments, sir. Cindy March, Tiffany Williams, and Erica Davis. Welcome, Ms. March. Good evening, Council. I'm in agreement with Lanier. Oh, thank you so much, Mayor, because it's unsafe when it's not happening to you. When you get sick with this E. coli, it's a serious problem. Water is a serious problem. I want you all to focus on working together. I sit here and I observe for the last 20 minutes. I've seen the conversation Mayor and you and Kashama was having. And when Dr. Spiritus came up, Kashama like that. That's not good. That don't look professional at all. It's all right not to like nobody, but we serve a city. We serve these residents. You all work for us. We don't work for you all. The least you all can do, and I hope you all will find it in your heart to do, is to work with Dr. Spiritus. Don't shove him off because he might have something that you all don't have or have knowledge of. You've been here for nine years. So therefore, sometimes it's good to change. And don't, don't just, it, it just was so disrespectful to me. And you all have certain people doing two and three jobs. That's why this water is like it is. It's when, what, where, how, and why. We need them answers. I mean, you go out and do two residents and it tests negative. Two residents don't solve the whole city of Rivera Beach. It's, stop, it's time to stop playing. We cannot move this city forward until we find transparency until we be honest with ourselves. You all got pet peeves, you need to get rid of the pet peeves and do the job that you was hired to do. Because you do have another election. You ran on clean water, Kashama. All of you all ran on clean water. It's not just about politics. Just because you're in that seat, prove yourself for the fourth term that you've been here. You're here for a reason. 
and the reason is to do your job. And I don't want to just elaborate on you because you don't run the whole council, but Evans, Jacobs, you all didn't care about what credentials they had. You all put them in that position when Evans came back. I was at that meeting. Lanier put you all in that position. Now it's trying to find out where, when, why, and how. We deserve them answers. Mr. Chair. Ms. Miller-Anderson, um, Normally I would not do this, but I do want to make sure I clear up what was just stated. Um, it's hard to understand <laughs> what was going on back here when you weren't back here. When Mr. Felder and I were speaking, it was regarding something that Mr. no other council person should be standing here listening to us because it could be a sunshine violation. So I did explain to Mr. Spirit as the mayor and I were speaking about something and that would not be appropriate for another council person to be a part of that. So that is why I asked him to not stand there or try to engage in our conversation. So please understand, I'm a professional at all times. I have nothing against anyone when it's time to do the business. I'm not a petty person. I know how to put things aside. It has nothing to do with that. So please do not speak on something you don't know about. Thank you for your comments. Good evening, Tiffany Williams. Um, last week on the, um, the last council, I mean, I was watching discussion and deliberations. And when I was watching, I was just imagining how embarrassing is that? I'm here watching a UD meeting, embarrassing, right? So Mayor, part of your investigation, I want you to find out, you probably already did, how many policies the city had when it relates to the employees. We have one in particular called a progressive discipline policy. I want you to ask the question, who does that apply to? Certain individual, is that a citywide thing? Because if that was me, we would have been gone. Paperwork signed, no investigation. How fair is that? My other issue is that the bonds pass. I want the parking wreck, the parking wreck. So we have Ben Flint, we have Dan Calloway, we have Cunningham Park, we have uh, Wells Jump. Since the boss passed for the parking rate, why don't we put plaques up there with a picture, a glass case, saying who these individuals were, how they represent our city. That's going to be important. I know we're coming up here, we're arguing and we're disrespecting each other, but we cannot allow the history of the city to disappear. Everybody talk about how the, the big developers are coming in here. We got to be careful because we know the games that they play. Next thing you know, Flint Park is gone. Dan Callaway Park is gone. We got to be very careful of how these games are played. So my um, third thing is um, the Civil Service Board. There's an employee Civil Service Board for the general employees. We need residents to get involved. We need employees to get involved. They has not been advertised. One member passed away, no advertisement. A member uh, uh, resigned, no advertisement. These are, we need two or possibly three residents on this board, two or three possible employees on this board. So I'm asking you guys, the ICE, the, um, the ICE staff to say, um, to advertise this with, for the residents on the water bill and um, possibly on social media and for the employees, the general employees to do an email to ask to nominate um, employees so we can vote for our employees to be on this service board. Because if they keep doing this, then next thing you know, that's going to disappear because they're going to say we didn't have participation. These are the games that they play. So I'm here for that so we can make that be known. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Erica Davis, Marvelous Washington, and Mary Brand. I believe we had a card from Erica Davis already. Oh, I'm sorry. Marvelous Washington, Mary Brand, and Doretta Paul. Good evening, Council, Mayor, City Attorney, City Manager. I'm Marvelous Washington, uh, Lone Pine Estates. Um, I'm up here for a couple reasons, um, and particularly first, Lone Pine Estates. We're hoping that when that item is brought forth, that you guys continue to support the residents of, in Lone Pine. I understand that you guys understand where we stand. The issue that we're having is we still haven't had a meeting with any city administration or representatives as it relates to what that project looks like. Um, it's very important that we do have a meeting with the residents out there at Lone Pine 
in absence of DR Horton representatives, because we should not be meeting with them and the representatives of the city, because we have some concerns that is not they should not be privileged to. And we will want a straight up answer from the city representatives as it relates to why the trees are already been labeled to be for removal, who's doing that, who's making sure that the property is being upkept as if it was still the golf course. Um, second, as a union employee, it hurts me to hear employees come up here and talk about their union contract. I have a copy of the union contract and I have spoke about this before and I noticed that they only received like a 2.5% increase one year. The police department have received a raise in almost seven years. It's embarrassing, it's unfair. Because if you're looking at it from a viewpoint looking out and as a resident, it seems as if you guys negotiate to the best of your abilities with the union contract and make sure that the city interest is protected. But when these developers come in here, it's automatically approved by the departments. You allow them to do whatever they want to do in our city. First, when these developers come in here, can we stop asking them to hire our residents? Because number one, we don't have programs in place to ensure that our residents are trained for these positions. But can we ask, when we say we want to do affordable housing, can you ask the developers to offer a percentage of those houses to city residents? City residents should have access to those houses for outside residents. If you talk to residents at the Blue Heron Estates and that senior facility, many of those residents in that senior facility are from out of town. And particularly where the property management is located and from Miami. So when you talk with these developers and you give up what the residents don't want you to do or some of our precious lands, ask those developers, can you offer a percentage of those affordable housing units to our current residents, not residents entering the city? Because when you infringe on the current residents with these developers coming in with this overdevelopment, those homes should go to existing residents and not residents trying to come into our city. Again, please start negotiating the contract in the best interest of our employees. I also would like to know what activities are in place to ensure that the insurance that the employees are paying for is lowered. Are there any health activities that's going on? Are there's any plan for a city employee clinic with found care coming on board? What is in place to lower the health costs? Thank you. Thank you for coming, Ms. Washington. Mary, Mary Brown, followed by Doretta Paul. Mayor Graham, Rivera Beach. First of all, I would like to give a shout out to Chairperson Wayne Riches uh, that chairs the Port of Palm Beach Board. The day was his birthday. When Ms. Graham stands here and tells you something here, when I say that I've been a part of this city for years, for decades, uh, this is a ticket from Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, 2006, when we were over at Newcomb Hall. And finally, we built out this place here, and here is this in 2016. And Ms. Bram spoke at the ribbon cutting here in the building that I'm standing here. So I do not fabricate anything. She has extensive history of our city and the mayor masters. I'm gonna say this as well. Mayor masters has served 12 plus counting years in the city here. In 2018, he was in his 12th year and an advocacy for the safety of our children. He was out on that battlefield long before Park, Park Lane shooting, putting it out there for the safety networks to be employed within our school district. And we as a city, we should say thank him for his hindsight and his insight in getting those to the point of where we are today. Masters was on this battlefield a long time ago, speaking the same thing what we as society all over the land are experiencing today. Put those safety networks in place. My master started that. Even, even with the bishop, the pope, he even went up there. He went everywhere that he could go to get someone to listen to him, that what we should be doing as a society in our schools. So kudos to you, Bishop Master. Ms. Bram and the others say kudos. So as a city, we should say thank you to him as well. So honor that man there for doing that and having the fortitude. And also, I would like to say it is an infestation in this city here, the mosquitoes. 
not the mosquitoes. We endured that too, but the termites. If we are to build in this city here, we, we have to eradicate some of this infestation here that these termites is imposing in our city. See, it, it is other things here. Water is life. We're moving. Like I constantly say, we're moving in the directions that we should go in. We are moving there. But it's also things that we have to take care of. On Sunday, I was to a fantastic event that the chair gave, and it was the people's budget. The people's budget consists of how are we going to take care of, of we as residents in this city here and the things that the residents should be mandated as you as a board of doing to move this city here forward in these positive directions. So I want to say thank you, and I would like the manager to speak on some of these I'm things so here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Doretta Pope. Thank you, Ms. Pope. Good evening. My name is Doretta Park, and I'm a citizen of Riviera Beach. And the last time I spoke here uh, at the podium uh, was the last council meeting. And um, I just want to uh, give clarification that uh, concerning Ms. Liz Wade, uh, I take nothing from Ms. Liz Wade. I hope she's still resting in peace. Uh, what I was uh, saying, noting that uh, Ms. Kashamba, Councilwoman Kashamba Miller Anderson, I should have said consecutive terms that she has uh, um, achieved taking nothing away from Ms. Liz uh, Wade and her family because she was an outstanding councilwoman. But I just want to clarify that because it was stated that she had 17 years plus with the county. And that's, that's marvelous, absolutely. And I want to also talk about the firefighters and the police men and women. I think they should give a raise. I know when I was in my career, we all got a raise every year. Sometimes it wasn't anything but 3.5, but we got a raise. And what these young men and women are doing out here for our community, taking care of us, I do think there should be money allowed to get some type of raise for them. I really do. And uh, Mr. Brody, I want to talk about him. Um, he's the librarian um, at our um, library director. He's doing an absolutely marvelous job with the children, with the community, with the seniors, with the programs he brings. And I just want to commend him for doing an excellent job. Also, Councilwoman Mrs. Lanier, um, she is also, Shirley Lanier is also doing a, a marvelous job. She has also had um, meetings at the uh, Brook Center and co collaborating with the um, citizens and also the police for the protection. And it's just fabulous what's going on and taking care of all the citizens. And um, that's basically all I have to say. And I thank you so much. And I wish that we can start having peace in these meetings, you know? And this bickering that's going on, Mayor, we just gotta start having peace. And I thank you very much. Mr. Chair, we are now on awards and presentations. Item 5A, Florida Power and Light Company, a brief overview of the city's electrical utility services, street lighting maintenance initiatives, and ongoing storm resilience building efforts. And before we go into that presentation, if Mr. Evans wants to address some of the public comments. 
Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, with respect to the, the comments from uh, union representatives, uh, staff is, is definitely working hard with regards to trying to resolve and remedy some of the concerns that have been articulated. And, and we've had a couple of executive sessions uh, speaking on a variety of, of topics uh, consistent with the union contracts and trying to, to get clarity. Um, obviously, I think this board knows that as it relates to property tax value, we did have the lowest property tax value increase in Palm Beach County at a little under 7%, and we did see significant increases as it relates to health insurance. But we are still trying to to resolve the issues with our uh, with our outstanding unions. Uh, we did have a, a, a conversation today uh, concerning the PBA and then look to have more robust discussions with um, the IAFF, uh, as you all know, at this point, I'm pretty involved in the union negotiations on the public safety side, and I've had uh, limited conversations with SCIU, and so um, I plan to make myself available to that so we can, can look to address that. One of the things that was communicated with regards to PBA not receiving a, a raise for seven years, that's not accurate. Um, April 1st, that would make, it, which would be the second year for PBA that hasn't received a increase, but we are uh, looking to address that. Uh, and that would be April 1st was when they would receive their, their other increase. And that would primarily be their step increase. But we are looking to, uh, to share that. I think some of you did receive a call today from labor council concerning um, some of the things that we are working on. And so our hope is to um, try to resolve the issues with our labor unions and, and resolve the issues. And then uh, get into the budget process as we're going to have a very robust uh, budget process and a lot of discussion and, and input from the board. So we are trying to, you know, land these contracts with regards to the legally available funds that is provided and plus to make sure that there is monies for all the labor unions and all your employees as well as, well as your non reps. Uh, with respect to the bonds, we are working uh, to get put together a public information campaign, a series of charrettes, as well as uh, thank you banners to the residents for supporting the public information or the public bonds. But we are not going to have a situation where we forget or bypass or neglect uh, our community's history. As we look to reimagine these spaces and improve these spaces, we certainly will make sure that we pay homage and respect to those that have paved the way for the opportunities that we have in front of us today. So there will be more than, than just the plaque and, and the like. It, there will be uh, some continuation of the names of some of those parks, but that's a, a policy discussion that, that you will have at a later date. Uh, with respect to your advisory boards, I am working on some correspondence that will go out to the community with regards to vacancies on our advisory boards concerning the Civil Service Advisory Board. Uh, that's the first bit of information that I had with respect to resignation or, or deaths that, that may have occurred on that particular board. But nonetheless, we will get all our advisory board positions uh, vacant. One of the things that we certainly would appreciate is the residents uh, fin filling out those applications and we will put out public information concerning what boards, what vacancy and what the time commitments are so you can make a informed decision. But we do need to have folks serve on our, our advisory boards. They are certainly critical. Uh, to the agency. Uh, with regards to health insurance, uh, that's one of the things that we've had a lot of conversations about. Uh, we are looking at ways to partner up uh, specifically with Found Care once that facility is available. But uh, if anyone's been ever involved with health insurance, it's, it's based on your claims to premium ratio. It's based on your plan experience. Uh, and we've had some challenging uh, years with regards to that. We have one a particular situation where medication for one of our plan participants is costing over a million plus dollars. Uh, so when you do have a situation where the plan is uh, experiencing increased costs as a result of, of health related issues, uh, we certainly have to look to resolve that. Uh, we do have health related activities um, that are provided for health fairs and, and screenings and like and there is preventative health that is available to the employees. Uh, with respect to the issue on termites, um, you know, a lot of us have experienced those, especially at a variety of different times, primarily in the evening hours. I did put in a call to, uh, because one of the comments that, that came up previous was that people were concerned with regards to the shipping containers that came in from the Port of Palm Beach. And so I did put in a call today to the executive director at the port to find out kind of what some of their protocols and procedures are 
and then I will be making a subsequent follow-up call to the county and, and to see what are, if there are any spraying uh, that is same similar to what they do for mosquitoes, if there's any other uh, opportunities to address that. But we have seen and, and we have received a lot of complaints with regards to that. Some of you have reached out concerning that uh, to me, so the staff is working on that. Uh, so with that said, um, Mr. Chair, that uh, that's my comments. Thank you, Mr. Evans. And board, um, we uh, I know we have a few additional comments based upon public comment and response from Mr. Evans. If we can't save these for commissioner comments, so we just get to the rest of the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Uh, we're on 5A? <clears throat> yes, Mr. Chair. At this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Public Works Director, Mr. Roberto Chavicio. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the City Council, um, Mr. City Manager, and Madam City Attorney, Roberto Travieso, a Public Works Director, and it's my pleasure to appear before you tonight, uh, joined by representatives from the Florida Power and Light Company, who is our electrical utility, uh, to make a brief presentation regarding the services um, and the work, the important work that uh, FPL, as the company is commonly, commonly known, uh, performs in our city and the partnership, the strong partnership that we continue to have uh, working with them. So uh, with um, to my left, uh, we have um, external affairs uh, manager, uh, Ms. Amy Kemp and uh, Mr. Elan uh, Coffer. And to my right, I have a uh, customer advisor, uh, Mr. Rudy uh, Toledo as well. Um, without further ado, I want, want to turn it over to uh, Mr. Uh, Kemp, I'm sorry, Mr. Coffer for the presentation. Thank you so much. and. Uh, Mayor, Council, and City Manager, and City Attorney, we appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, before I jump in, um, as as you mentioned, we have a few of us here today. Um, I did want to just kind of let you know that due to some changing roles, um, Ms. Kemp will be kind of taking over as the External Affairs Manager uh, with oversight for the city. Um, and it's been a pleasure to serve you, and, and I'm really excited to turn it over to Amy, who's, who's going to do a fantastic job as well. Um, but as was mentioned, we have a couple, um, you know, important aspects to talk about tonight. And we, of course, would be happy to answer any questions as well. But we'll go ahead and jump into it. Um, so first, just wanted to, uh, for you or for anyone in the audience who may be watching, just wanted to kind of give a little overview of, of the company itself. Um, Florida Power and Light Company is the largest utility in the state of, electric utility in the state of Florida, um, serving a, a little over 5.8 million customers across 43 counties and serving over 35,000 square miles of Florida territory. Um, we'll go through all the statistics, but just to kind of give a kind of scale of some of the things that we're dealing with, uh, we have over 1.3 million distribution poles and 1.1 million transformers throughout the territory. Um, so we obviously have a, a lot going on. Um, we also um, you know, pride ourselves on being the most reliable utility in the United States. Um, we continue to build the strongest and smartest grid in the United States. Um, you may have seen different crews working out in terms of hardening or undergrounding. Um, we're very proud of the fact that 95% uh, of our transmission structures are now concrete or steel. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about it in a few minutes, but we're very happy to see the results in terms of weather response and storm response improving as we strengthen that grid. Um, but today, just got, we wanted to kind of particularly focus on um, in response to some of the uh, information discussions we had with your, your staff that it would be helpful to kind of talk a little bit about both uh, vegetation management and our streetlight program. Um, so just to kind of, you know, intro and then I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Toledo. Um, but just a little bit about our power delivery team. Um, one of the ways we help ensure that reliability is by reducing and trimming vegetation uh, on or near the lines. Um, educating um, our customers, which is part of what we're trying to do here today. Um, for those watching on, on the right maintenance of vegetation around power lines and collaborating with local leaders like yourself on our Right Tree, Right Place program. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Toledo, who's gonna walk through a couple of our slides. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about tree trimming and our street light program. So first off, we'll talk about um, our tree trimming, um, how FPL keeps trees away from the power lines. Uh, we, trim, uh, we trim trees and vegetation near power lines on a consistent plan, uh, plan trimming, and we also do clearing cycles. So we do main power lines uh, every three, three years on an average cycle, uh, neighborhood lines 
a six year average cycle and then mid cycle hot spots. We address uh, fast growing trees and vegetation as needed. And of course, if there's uh, any trouble type areas, um, you know, we, we act on those accordingly. And we, uh, we serve 17,000 miles of vegetation uh, trim, and that's trimmed annually. And I'm sorry to interrupt. If we can, we do have a couple questions from the board. If we can just kind of inquire during the presentation, uh, Ms. Lanier. So it's just something simple. I wanted to know what is your process when you go into uh, neighborhoods to cut back trees, you know, on private property? How do you negotiate that? How do, how do we, I'm sorry, how do we negotiate? <laughs> no, I, I know you just don't go into the person's yard and start cutting trees. So I'm saying, how do you do that? So mo most of the power lines are within like our easements. Um, but yeah, we, we might have to reach out to customers to, to gain access. I mean, safety is a big thing with us. So, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're clear to get to the, to the lines, make sure there's no dogs in the yards and stuff like that. So we, we very well may reach out if we don't have clear, clear cut access. Well, I asked that question because a resident called me one time and said that, that there's a female in her backyard and she didn't know what they were doing. So that's why I asked how, what's the process that you take to go into people's private property to be able to cut back even your easement? Right. Yeah. I mean, if we do have access, I can see that happening. If, if we have access to get to the lines, we, you know, we would approach them. So do you think that you can let the residents know when you come to their yard? Well, I think that to your point, if there, we do try to notify um, customers before we're going to go on property, um, that doesn't always happen if there's clear access. But if there's a particular instance or there's particular areas where that's occurring, if you could let us know, we'd be happy to take a look at that to make sure we can improve the communication there. Certainly. That's the chair. And along those lines, the um, I think it's important, too, to kind of coordinate with public works in terms of the uh, trash pickup schedule because I know that did happen to us where it was put out on the side of the street like two or three days before trash pickup and you know the residents will be held responsible for that because they don't know FPNL are the ones that came and did that so I think it's important to make sure that the schedules for trash pickup is coordinated because it, it wasn't done before. Mr. Chair, if I may, sure, I, go ahead. I, w I want to highlight that um, I'm in regular contact with Mr. Toledo uh, regarding this and other matters. So certainly it is important that we continue that coordination and that uh, any um, the tree clearing uh, work uh, can be uh, coordinated to the properties that may be affected and also uh, that that debris be recovered on a timely manner, particularly as we get into our storm season. Uh, so we'll continue that conversation and uh, work closely with uh, FPL. And Mr. Travisio, that was a, just a follow up with that same lines. Residents, when they have those um, lines and the trees are actually encroaching, encroaching on the power lines, who would be the point of contact for them? Because um, I've got lots of calls about residents wanting the trees actually trimmed back from the power lines. Who would be that point of contact? And I want you guys to get to the presentation. That was one of my questions, but since I, we're in line with those right now. Absolutely. You can call the, the regular uh, customer service line to report any kind of tree trimming request. Uh, yeah, so I mean, they could report through them or, you know, they can also come through us. And I guess the concern is even myself, I've tried that customer service line I wasn't able to get through. So it's just, what is a, a easier means for our residents? So would they contact the city? Do we have other ports of contact? So there's actually on the website, there's a vegetation request line. So I'll make sure to provide, provide that to your staff so that you have that as well to provide your residents. And I've seen kind of some uh, pitfalls with that vegetation line. So it's just making sure that we can have a clear communication so when residents reach out. Me personally and other residents have inquired about that, um, especially coming up on uh, hurricane season. I want to make sure that we've addressed that and give a clear communication with staff, uh, with residents to either staff or direct communication to FPNL. Mr. Chair, for me. Mr. Chair, yes, yeah. I, they can always contact the Public Works Department. We're happy to assist. And, and again, I'm, I'm in direct contact with FPL um, in, in occasions where we may need to expedite or address an issue that perhaps was reported <clears throat> excuse me, and was not addressed um, according to our expectations. Uh, so certainly uh, the public members of the public property owners are welcome to always contact Public Works um, at our 561-845-4000. Um, 
4080 number or email publicworks at rivierabeach.org uh, for assistance uh, with these matters. Thank you, Director. And apologize if you can go ahead with the presentation. Thank you. All righty. Uh, so next, uh, we have uh, tree and vegetation trimming is a shared responsibility. We want to share that responsibility between us and the customer. Um, so you can go to the next slide. And uh, what, what can customers do to help keep trees away from the power lines? Uh, we promote the FPL right tree, right place guidelines. And, and as you can see here, it's a little small on the board, but large trees, you know, 50 feet or taller should be about a 50, 50 foot minimum setback. Medium trees, uh, 14 to 49 feet should be about 30, 30 feet minimum setback. And then large palm should be 20 feet. Um, All right, what customers can do, always hire a qualified professional uh, to, to tr tree, yeah, trim trees or other vacate, uh, vegetation near power lines. Uh, plant only small trees and shrubs in areas adjacent to power lines and call 811 before you dig. Uh, you know, keep yourself and uh, the end of any object or holding at least 10 feet from your neighborhood power lines and 30 feet from the transmission line. So, you know, Definitely safety first when it comes to trimming near trees, uh, near power lines. All right, so I want to get into uh, street lights. I feel is also responsible for managing and restoring about 950,000 street lights. Uh, street lighting restoration overview. Uh, we have 822,000 street lights in the uh, peninsula of Florida, 127,000 street lights in northwest Florida. 68% uh, of the outages of street light tickets uh, serve the counties or municipalities. So uh, we have listed here the process of how to report a street light, which I want to talk to. Uh, ticket creation, you know, a light, uh, a lighting ticket is entered through FPL.com, the care center, customer calls, or smart node technology, which is nodes on the street lights that automatically report to us. 99% um, of the tickets are customer initiated. Um, scheduling, you know, tickets are assigned to FPL crews or vendors. Um, then we have completion of the tickets. Tickets are worked in the field. As build of tickets, FPL reconciles materials, approves vendors, invoices. Um, FPL calls customers back to provide updates and discuss any issues. And then you have the ticket closure. You know, FPL closes outstanding requirements and work order. Uh, FPL contacts elevated customers to ensure satisfaction. Um, and I just wanted to share, you know, we, we've had some, some street light outages here uh, that we were able to address. We had about 75 tickets uh, that we were able to complete since January. Um, we're, we're happy to announce that, you know, a lot of the backlog has been completely clean. And uh, right now we only have 23 tickets in the area. Uh, that are that were new tickets uh, as of April 1st. So uh, we'll continue to keep our eyes on that and schedule them accordingly. And before we jump into a, a brief discussion on Storm, I want to thank both you, Roberto, as well as your police department on their, a lot of them on their night shifts kind of are able to do some checking and kind of notifying us um, before, you know, this gets reported otherwise. So we appreciate their constant communication to keep us in the loop on what, what's going on. And uh, we, we look forward to continuing that cooperation as we deal with some of these streetlight issues. Mr. Chair. Thanks, Go ahead. Uh, I would just uh, like to mention that uh, two to three condominiums on Singer Island had lights out, FPL lights out. It took over two months to get them fixed. Is that normal? So right now, the average uh, time that we provide is about 40 days. Um, that's not where we'd like it to be. Um, we are continuing to pour more Reese's. It's, it's been a statewide issue, both from a resource and a supply chain issue. So we're continuing to bring in more and more contractors to address it statewide. And we're hoping to continue to drive down that, that repair time. So it's not where we want it to be yet, but we're, we're continuing to improve on that time. And hopefully it'll get back to uh, kind of pre-COVID times as soon as we can. Thank you. 
When transitioning to Storm, first of all, thank you so much for, for having us and for helping us share some of the, the information and resources for the residents. Hurricane season kicks off on June 1st and it goes through November. So of course, as a utility, we're talking about vegetation. We're talking about all the things that we can do to prevent those outages. Uh, but it is very important for us to ensure that we can share those tips with residents because we can prepare as a utility, but of course, for residents, uh, they can actually get some resources from fpl.com forward slash storm, uh, where they can have uh, some kits on how to be prepared for uh, not only storm, how to prepare your plan, and how to make sure that you know the local resources and support. From an FPL perspective, we do partner with the Emergency Operations Center to designate all the critical infrastructure within the county to make sure that when there is a storm, we can restore power as quickly and efficiently as possible. Uh, the simple way I like to explain it is that we always like to and have to really start with those facilities that actually help us generate power. So our, our power plants, our transmission lines, and ultimately make sure that we're restoring the largest amount of customers as quickly as possible. Uh, so I do want to point out that the county emergency personnel are the ones that do designate that critical infrastructure, and it is what we use uh, to make sure that we restore that power quickly and efficiently. We have many ways that we are continuing to, of course, try to mitigate those outages and reduce the restoration time frame, as Ilana alluded to one of the, the earlier slides. Uh, but uh, we are continuing to prepare for that. We are going to have uh, our annual storm dry run as, as we do a, a practice as a company where all of our employees actually simulate a storm impacting our territory so that we can train and prepare and make sure that we can respond quickly uh, when those do storms do impact. But with that, just want to thank you again for your time. Uh, I have been with the company for about eight years, so not necessarily new and definitely look forward to working with all of you. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you to everyone that came out tonight. Just one Board thing, members. Mr. Chair. Mr. Anderson, go ahead. Um, the lighting. Um, I brought it up during my agenda review about the street lights. Um, I guess the newer ones don't put out as much light. And in some of the neighborhoods, I think it's just extremely dark. Um, from the lighting that they had before, which could pose a safety issue. Are you all doing an assessment or is it possible to do an assessment of some of these neighborhoods to see if the lights can be uh, made to be a little brighter because it, it, it's very dark on a lot of the streets? Sure, so uh, thank you for that. And a couple, uh, we have a couple lighting options and sort of um, uh, the actual brightness of those bulbs. If you have some specific scenarios where there is that concern, definitely would be happy to take that back. Uh, we have different programs where we can make sure we can get that upgraded or corrected. All right, I'm good with Mr. Gervasio. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I may, Mr. Evans, uh, to, to provide uh, some additional commentary, I, I'd like to get uh, Director Trevisio to provide some comments. Him and I have had conversations with regards to an overall analysis of looking at our roadway network in our community, but and, and obviously the street lightings. And so he's come up with some really good ideas that we want to come back before you to, to try to address that. Uh, Mr. Trevisio, if you can, can speak to that in greater specificities. Mr. Chair, if I may. Please. Thank you. The um, criteria for um, minimum lighting standards on, on roadways is set um, by the Florida Department of Transportation uh, in a document called the uh, Green Book. So uh, what uh, we are proposing to do is to conduct an analysis um, of uh, the existing street lighting, uh, both uh, the ones that are owned by the Florida Power and Light Company, as well as a significant number that is owned and maintained by the city uh, to determine which corridors within the city actually meet criteria and then develop a strategy, a capital improvement project that can be phased in over the uh, various uh, fiscal years and prioritize based on the areas that may be underserved, uh, not, not having enough lighting, um, and also um, areas that could be more prompt to crime, to traffic accidents, et cetera. So uh, we will be bringing uh, forth uh, in the next uh, few months uh, a proposal that will uh, seek to study um, the uh, lighting um, with, throughout the city and develop a strate strategic plan to help us address those needs specifically um, where it's needed most. There's no comments? Well, thank you so much. I also wanted to say thank you for the support you've been giving for the community events and the, the community cleanups, uh, just being a partner with the different events as well. So just showing your presence in the community and uh, everything that you've done for that being now. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. 
Madam Clerk. Item 5B presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, on the upcoming changes to the solid waste connection schedule in certain neighborhoods within the city of Rivera Beach, as well as the notification and public outreach strategy. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Mr. Chair, members of the board, I'm gonna turn this presentation over to our public works director, Mr. Roberto Trevisio. Good evening again, honorable mayor, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'm pleased to be joined today um, by representatives from our um, partners in the solid waste management uh, within the city of the Good Company, uh, Mr. Uh, Will uh, D. Good, um, who is the CEO uh, of the company, and then uh, Mr. Chris uh, McAfee, who is our administrative liaison as well. And uh, again, I'm Public Works Director, uh, Roberto Travieso. As this uh, council is aware, back in um, the fall of 2022, we entered into a franchise agreement with a good company uh, for the uh, provision of solid waste management services uh, within the city. And that contract uh, permits that for costs, uh, from time to time, the contractor may submit to the city uh, for its review and approval a request to change collection schedules. And uh, typically, uh, and they're not uncommon in the uh, solid waste industry, but typically those requests are submitted uh, for the purpose of increasing efficiencies and balancing the workload across the, um, the service area. Public Works Department oversees the contract and serves uh, as the evaluator on such a request on behalf of the city, of the city manager and uh, the good company recently submitted a request uh, to make uh, such a change and it will affect uh, about a dozen neighborhoods within the city uh, so we thought it important uh, to present uh, these uh, plan changes that will go into effect on may 14th uh, to the city council as well as for the benefit um, of the public so i'd like to briefly review uh, what those changes are And uh, we are expecting, uh, we're announcing changes to the recycling collection schedule um, in the Park Manor North uh, community, Plumosa Park, Riviera Shores, Miramar Park, Inlet Shores, and Marina Grande that will change the collection of recyclable materials uh, from the current Saturday uh, uh, schedule to a Wednesday uh, type schedule. Uh, there are no changes uh, announced or expected to the bulk a collection or the vegetation a collection. That will remain on Wednesday as it is at this point. Additionally, uh, we're announcing changes to the recycling, to the bulk and to the vegetation collection schedules in the communities of Park Manor South, Curlington Park, Lakeview Park, Coconut Lodge, Northview and Inlet Grove that would change the collection of recycling bulk and vegetation um, goods and materials from the current Saturday schedule to a Tuesday schedule, again, beginning on May 14th, uh, 2024. Finally, we are announcing changes to the trash collection schedule in the communities of Park Manor South, Carrollington Park, Lakeview Park, Coconut Lodge, Northview, and Inlet Grove from a Wednesday and Saturday trash collection schedule to a Tuesday and Friday trash uh, collection schedule. I want to highlight that none of these uh, changes that, again, will go into effect on May 14th will change the service level that is provided to uh, our residents, to our properties, only the day in which those materials are collected uh, is changing as allowed uh, per the contract. So what are we doing to notify uh, the public? Uh, we're actually partnering and working closely with the good company uh, in regards to uh, this uh, effort. And the good company uh, is making preparations in coordination with city staff to distribute door hangers in each of the affected neighborhoods and those door hangers will be distributed uh, two weeks prior to the, the May 14th uh, effective date for the announced uh, changes. And then again, one week prior to the effective date of the announced uh, uh, changes. Uh, those notifications per the terms and conditions of the 
uh, franchise agreement uh, represent no additional cost to the city or to the affected uh, residents. Additionally, the Public Works Department uh, will be working closely with our public information officer and other appropriate departments to share information uh, via the city's website, social media platforms, and also in community meetings, uh, specifically uh, tomorrow, uh, the Good Company and uh, Public Works will be attending uh, the uh, uh, neighborhood meetings, the HOA meetings uh, in the Park Manor uh, communities uh, to present this information also uh, for their benefit. We will certainly uh, remain available at the Public Works Department and the Good Company will remain available uh, to assist uh, residents with answering any questions during this transition uh, period. Mr. Chair, that concludes our presentation. I will be uh, happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. Question on the board? Yes. Um, Councilwoman Lanier, go ahead. Um, so the, the residents will get a, how far of a notice in terms of this change? I see it's here tonight, but in terms of alerting the residents to what, when this happens. Mr. Chair, if I may. Please, Mr. Trevizo. The good company will be providing uh, door hangers directly to each property within the affected neighborhoods two weeks out from May 14th and again one week out from um, May 14th. So we'll be distributing those door hangers um, twice uh, prior to implementation and uh, the uh, city staff uh, will be making uh, corresponding social media and website advertisements uh, to the same effect. Okay, and also the second thing is that um, there still needs to be additional information, public information to the residents about the quote unquote trash piles, meaning that for 30 years the city had unlimited pickup. Now it is six cubic yards that you have to have to be able to um, have them to pick it up and anything over they are charged for. So there needs to be more information about that process because I've gotten calls from people asking about why am I being charged $200 on my water bill to be able to pick up trash. So I think that a lot of people still have in their minds about the unlimited pickup. And that whole part about six cubic yards is very foreign given the fact that it's almost been a year, but still people did that for 30 years. So I think there needs to be more um, resident information, whatever you need to do to get them to understand when they put stuff outside and it goes past that six cubic yards that they have to pay over for that. Mr. Chair? Ms. Williamson? Um, with the, when they're over six cubic yards or feet or whichever one it is, um, are they charged just above that or are they charged for the entire amount? So if it's nine, are they being charged for the three that is over or are they being charged for the nine? Because I've gotten some calls. Chair President. Mr. Good, go ahead. Still going to use this. So uh, yes, uh, to answer your question, we are planning more meetings with the, with the, uh, with staff to have an actual meeting where we did the uh, Let's Talk Trash meeting to actually address those um, questions of what it is, why they're getting charged and things of, nat of that nature. I think that'll be a better place where we can actually plan for it and really address those those questions to your point. And uh, 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 Councilwoman, uh, we are, it's, it's the whole pile. And the effort is to curb the, the, the piles out there being over six QBRs to be in, be in conformity. So we're not charging uh, just, if it's if it's nine QBRs, we're not just charging three QBRs, we are charging the whole nine QBRs, ma'am. But why would you do that if the six is allowable? Uh, that is how the contract is written. Um, that's that's how it is written. Mr. Chair, if I may. Mr. Vizio. Every time a non-compliance pile is, um, is identified or is tagged, it requires a second trip of that truck, unscheduled trip, uh, which carries expenses 
uh, associated with that. So the way the contract was uh, negotiated, and it is a standard practice really in, in, in the uh, industry um, to curve um, non-compliant PALs, uh, the, there's a penalty associated with um, a second trip or a special pickup, a special collection uh, trip uh, to collect that PAL, to recover that PAL. So when it is over, um, are we educating the, the residents at that time and giving them an opportunity to remove some of the trash before getting um, fined? Mr. Chair, if I may. Please, Mr. Professor. Yes, um, we are doing that uh, currently uh, through the TAG, um, which provides a direction uh, for them. Uh, two options, one, uh, to make the pile compliant by removing the excess um, uh, material. Uh, they can certainly contact uh, the good company, they can contact uh, the Public Works Department for assistance or by uh, scheduling for a special pickup uh, through the Public Works Department or directly uh, with a good company uh, for, for such a service. So, so information in terms of how to proceed is provided. And uh, we recently met with city administration with a good company uh, to uh, discuss and brainstorm strategies that will help us to further uh, provide transparent uh, information and actionable information uh, for our customers um, in regards to how to meet the uh, requirements, how to comply with the requirements uh, in the uh, solid waste uh, code, um, and also um, how to address any uh, concerns that they might have. And one last question. Yeah, um, for the, I guess some few months back, there was, I guess, oil or something that came from the truck that spilled along 34th, 35th Street, somewhere in that area, as well as in like Riviera Cove. Um, has, has that money been recouped for the, the cleaning or whatever needed to be done to fix that? Last week, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, we pay for that directly with our subcontractor. There's no cost to the city if, if our truck spills any oil or any trash juice. We uh, our subcontractor goes on um, there and cleans that up, so it's no cost to the city. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. And I appreciate you all coming out tomorrow to the Park Manor Neighborhood Association meeting because the um, the changes. I'm sorry, Chair. The changes that were made. You know, on that Friday, I received the notice on the door and it was to go in effect on that Monday. And there was a lot of confusion that occurred because of that. And it went on for beyond a week because people didn't know that, you know, they didn't know what to do, even though we tried to let them know that it was not to change, but it was just a short notice anyway. So I'm happy to see that there's a two week and then a one week notice because given that three or four day notice over the weekend was not, that was not acceptable at all. And um, I wound up getting it off of my door and contacted Mr. Evans because I know we had, someone had just come up to the podium uh, during a meeting a week or two before that. And I remember the conversation being, they said that something was, their time, their schedule was being changed. And Mr. Evans said, we had not had that conversation yet. And so, um, and then for me to come out my house and find this tag on my door, I was a little confused. So I'm glad to see we're doing that, but I just ask that in the future, if we have to do anything that's going to change things, please make sure we give the residents enough notice because it was a lot of confusion going on. Um, and it would, that wasn't, you know, it wasn't necessary. So, I mean, I'm glad we're doing it this way now. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Molinia, go ahead. Yeah, I have one, well, two um, questions. Well, not questions, observations. One of them is that um, we get calls about residents saying that when you pick the trash up, you leave stuff behind in the street, um, around the trash pile. And I've gotten pictures of when they do a pickup on a trash pile and there's stuff scattered around it or in the street. So I've gotten a lot of pictures of that. I'll forward it to you. And the second thing in regards to that and to um the resident notifications you need to do something in particular neighborhoods um, i understand that you want to have that you have this big you know let's talk trash but you need to really get intimate with these neighborhoods because um you know having like park manor and you know uh inlet grove or whatever neighborhood there is especially where we're getting the most calls from to actually go into those neighborhoods and explain to residents about the six cubic yards about 
you know, if you if trash is left back from picking up a trash pile, this is who you call that kind of thing. And I think that it'll cut down a lot of confusion and calls for us um, about what's happening with how you do business in the city. But, you know, I'm hoping that we can resolve that. It's almost a year now that we were we're coming up on. So is it two years. Whoa. So that means that we really need to make sure that a lot of these issues are addressed and that residents, you know, um, get that to a minimum in terms of calling their council persons about uh, what's happening with the garbage in their neighborhoods. Thank you. Additional comments? So I just had some feedback as well. Um, I believe Mr. Good did comment on the Let's Talk Trash. During our agenda review, we talked about doing this Let's Talk Trash. Well, uh, Ms. Uh, Jacobs really worked with the good company to get it started. I want to see those done quarterly. So if staff and the good company can bring in those like saw trash so we can have those conversations, whether they're here in the marina or throughout the different um, areas, let's just have the conversation so we can keep the residents engaged while we've got this two years in. So congratulations to you guys and thank you. Um, with the growing pains, with the changes, you guys have been here for two years, but our residents are used to a level of service for the last 20 years. So it may not be the same level of service, especially with the change in regards to the six cubic yards. And that's gonna be the next thing I wanna address. I just wanna get clarity. Um, if they put out the six cubic yards and it's uh, tagged that they've gone over eight, nine or 10, then it's then the amount is gonna be charged back to the resident if it's over that six cubic yards and they're gonna be charged at what amount? Is that gonna be at the seven, eight, nine, ten 10 cubic yards? How are they charged as a resident? Sure. Um, so the uh, for vegetation, if it's if it's clean vegetation, <laughs> if it's clean vegetation, it's eight eight dollars per cubic yard. If it's bulk trash, it's twenty two dollars per cubic yard. And then they'll be charged at that for the entire amount for yes, all sir. seven eight nine. Okay. Yes, sir. So my colleague brought it up, and I wanted to readdress that. And the reason I'm bringing it back up is because I wanted to get clarity to make sure I heard it right. Um, and I just couldn't believe that we're charging them for the entire amount because if they put out six cubic yards, they won't be billed. So how are we going to address that? Because I understand I, I heard Mr. Good and I took notes in between my nap about it being um, that it's part of the contract. Uh, how can we address that, Mr. Evans or Mr. Travisio? What, what, what is it that we can do? Because that just doesn't seem fair to the residents to be paying if they put out the six cubic yards and they go over by one, two or three yards that they're going to pay the difference across the entire amount. So what can we do? Mr. Chair, for me. Mr. Travisio. The, the practice is, is not uh, unique um, to, to the city of Riviera Beach. Um, and, and again, is predicated on the um, preference that per, um, residents, uh, customers participate in accordance with uh, established policies and procedures in solid waste management within the community. So it's a partnership between the city uh, the residents and the contractor who actually performs uh, the work. Uh, so ideally, and, and I forget co-compliance also, uh, who works uh, closer with us uh, in this uh, regard. But um, it is uh, an, an effort or the goal, the objective uh, is to uh, promote compliance uh, with through education um, and ultimately um, by having users of the uh, solid waste utility uh, provide uh, fees or payments to the extent that they receive service that are going to support or cover the costs associated uh, with the, uh, those services. For a number of years, um, those costs were not bore directly or fully by um, users of the utility. Um, so uh, as far as the contract uh, stands right now, um, maybe uh, the Madison City Attorney can speak to that, but uh, it's my understanding that the contract is, is not open or cannot be reopened for negotiation. And those are the terms uh, that were uh, negotiated uh, within the contract. Um, I'm, and sorry. I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, you said the contract cannot be reopened for negotiation? That's correct. That's been the information that has been uh, provided uh, to provided me. Provided by who? Any contract is up for negotiation. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure because it's also up for, for termination. So we have the ability to terminate. We have the ability to renegotiate. I'm confused as to why we could not. Mr. Evans? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll defer as it relates to the, the, the contractual language that is, that is provided for. Uh, with respect to the, the level of service, I think one of the things that 
um, was stated earlier is the success of the Lex Let's Talk Trash event. Well, Mr. Um, Evans, before we go on a level of service, can we address the contract question? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd Please. have to defer that particular item to the uh, to the to the city attorney. But I, what I believe that Director Trevisio was talking about is that you know what the language is is that it's probably for a set term. And yes, you do have the ability to effectively probably terminate the agreement with following whatever procedural elements. But I don't know if the price is 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 codified in the agreement. And I think that's more specifically what was talked to, but I have to defer to legal. I don't have the contract up in front of me. Of course. Attorney Wynn? Mr. Chair, Please. I don't have the contract in front of me either. However, there's always the opportunity to, to reopen and negotiate if both parties are willing to. And what we have to talk about is what does that look like? Okay. Well, tonight, sorry, uh, give me one second, uh, Dr. Spears. Tonight's conversation is more so in line with um, the schedule changes. And I know that staff wasn't prepared with that information, but being that it was presented to us as a concern that we've been hearing in reference to the six cubic yards, I, I would definitely want to revisit and take a look at that and identify what, with two years of experience in the community, what it would look like to possibly go back to unlimited uh, trash collection, what it would look like to, to increase that number. Because with the education, we're not doing a good enough job of educating our residents. We've hosted one Let's Talk Trash in two years. I want to get out those mailers to the residents and educate them on the process. So if we're going to change it completely, then let's do that. The contract that was negotiated, I, I mean, I couldn't believe what I was hearing from Ms. Miller Anderson in reference to us charging anything from one to from zero to nine, 10, 12 cubic yards when they're already getting the first six for free. So even though it's standard practice, it's not gonna be standard practice here. So that's why I wanna know what does the contract look like? When does the contract expire? And can this be renegotiated or reopened? So those are some of the concerns I have because we're getting beat up by this contract in reference to those concerns. And I wanna hear what those uh, things can be addressed outside of this with this outreach. Um, to keep it compliant and germane to what we're talking about tonight, if we can put in the water bill, Mr. Evans, uh, the change as well, because if the goods company is going to put out the, the mailers on the doors and we have a defined area, if we can also define that area with the water bill to outline where um, the changes are going to take place within that park manor area. Yeah. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, if I may, yeah. um, specific to the six cubic yards, we did do community mailers. Uh, we did do uh, educational videos and the like. And as it relates to non-compliance pile, I think the good company and staff have worked. I think the number on any given time is maybe 20 uh, piles that you, you on average. Uh, so if you look at the number of households and, and, and you know, uh, it's a small fraction of a number of persons that are putting out uh, larger piles. But one of the things we did have a conversation this week about was a dual verification process whereby the good company will go out there and they will survey and tag those piles. And then that same day, they will provide our staff person with a notification as to where those piles are. And then our staff will go out and attempt to make contact with the residents and say, you have a pile that's non-compliant. It's three yards over, it's six yards over, what have you, and giving an opportunity for the resident to cure it before the 72 hour for the persons to effectively, um, for the good company to come in and recover it if in fact it is not taken care of. So we are also gonna document the times in which we tried to attempted to make contact with the residents we talked about, even multiple tags on the pile facing the home, facing the roadway and those types of things. So we are putting in additional mechanisms to ensure that if somebody does have a pile that's two or three yards too large that they have the opportunity to cure it or bring it, you know, bring it into compliance. Um, so we are looking to do that. Uh, but with respect to the, the schedule change, um, that's probably uh, depending on the, the cycle and, and where the utility uh, bills go out for that, depending on the split. We can definitely try to put it in the utility bill, but it may be something that we have to also canvas the neighborhood to ensure that there is uh, adequate notice to, uh, to the affected parties. And in addition to that, the, the non-compliant piles, the cost, uh, the, the good company would have that tracking um, as to what the non-compliant pile cost would be. The city, I know we've covered the cost for a certain period when we were trying to address the change in the contract. So can we have those numbers and details of what the non-compliant 
piles have cost the city, and then what the goods company is charging for those non-compliant piles. I want to identify what that looks like. So before we have the discussion again to bring the contract back or to discuss uh, what is going to be this cost to the residents, I want to kind of see what that cost looks like. And Mr. Chair, Mr. Also, also with that, I think it's appropriate that staff look at the terms that are provided for because this was a competitive solicited process and if in fact you move to a unlimited uh veg and, and bulk pickup there is you know there is cost implications about that I, I know from the if i can recall uh the good company for the services that they're providing and the previous provider the costs were almost double mm -hmm. um and so invariably uh, if you did go to an unlimited and the good company is our provider, you can anticipate the cost increasing on the residents as well. But we'll be able to look at what the cost the city has incurred in picking it up. We'll look at what the contract is, and then we'll provide some correspondence to the board with regards to that and what your options may be. Yeah, if we can't have that back, because the biggest concern that I have tonight is going to be that six cubic yards. I know the discussion is just kind of the changes in schedule. Um, the request was put in uh, by the good company. Mr. Trevesio, I asked during the agenda review, uh, you said about two months ago, did you get that exact time frame when the request was put in? No, Chair, I apologize. Okay. Mr. Chair. Um, go ahead, Dr. Sweeney. We're two years into this contract. Can you please tell me when the contract expires? Mr. Chair, if I may. Mr. Trevesio. It's my understanding that uh, it's a seven year contract. If I may, it's a seven-year contract with a three-year extension, so a 10-year contract. And also, may I address the uh, six QB guards? So, so, so the reason it was, it was, it was a common, it was a practice already with, if it was six QB guards or if it was nine QB guards, for instance, and it was a practice with SWA, they would only charge the three QB guards over that opened it up for uh, interpretation. So they found the solid waste authority found that it was more, more, more standard to say, okay, if, if we have the the contractor goes back and have to pick up the pile, they would pick up, they would charge for the entire pile. So it was it, it was a cost for interpretation as far as my understanding. And also there is uh, disposal credits based on the housing um, in the in that area, which that every contractor that does business is allowed through the solid waste authority. So it is a disposal cost that is associated with any yardage that we pick up. So if we're not charging for that extra yardage, then uh, operationally, it doesn't make sense for the contractor. So that's how it became, uh, they were charged for the entire pile. But I guess that you're charging for the extra yardage, but in addition, you're charging from zero to six, which is already included within the contract. So the additional yardage of seven, eight, nine, ten. I can understand that. What I don't understand is why we have a contract that's charging residents that are already included within the contract for the zero through six. If I may, that's for the compliance aspect of it and the cost that's associated with going back to the PAL to pick up, um, it, whether it's on uh, the next service day or on an unscheduled service day. And then who goes back out to view that PAL? That is a ta red tag and is the city check for compliance or the goods company? So the good companies will go and uh, take the pile, right. and then the city will go and verify the the actual yardage. So if we say it's twelve yards, the city will go back and verify that it's twelve yards. And then that's what I'm saying. That cost you're saying that that cost is incorporated for going back out, but then that's the city that's actually going back out to the, check the, the pile. Well, the truck will have to go back and actually pick up. The actually pile. pick it up after yes, they passed it the first time. Yes, sir. Understood. <laughs> sir, if I may, of course, uh, please, Mr. Sir, uh, Chris McAfee, good company. So. The objective is if I go to a, a resident and there's 10 yards out and I only pick up six and leave four, then we have another issue of you only picked up six and left four. So it was it, it, it makes it a blanket process. And then the city, when they interpreted this contract, when we initially talked to Miss McBride and Tanisha Boyan, it was to keep the city clean. Uh, when we practice this in other municipalities, it's uh, the residents are conforming. I think uh, the city manager said that there are 20 piles. Uh, which out of 10,000 uh, single family homes, it's not bad. The residents are actually conforming and complying to the process. And I do know that with the community conversation we had that um, residents were informed about it. I just wanted to continue to do that on a consistent basis. So um, uh, we did do a good job with the community charrette that was hosted. If we can continue to do that and educate the residents. Mr. Evans, you said it was only about 20 out of compliant uh, piles on mm -hmm. average? 
Ms. Ms. Chair, um, the, the, la the latest report that I received from the good company this week as it relates to non-conforming piles, that it's around that 20, maybe under that 20 mark. And that's been significant since what was at the height, how many non-compliant piles did you guys have? Well, we took over the contract in October. From October to December, we probably had about what, 40 to 60 non-compliant piles throughout the city. And that's not including the vacant lot piles that we picked up as well. Good. And, and Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, one of the things that you'll also see when you do go to unlimited bulk, um, you do have situation where people utilize illegal dumping or they dump their, uh, their vegetation from their landscaping businesses and, and what have you. And so uh, we've seen, you know, that actually that behavior curtail uh, as well uh, as a result of, of some of the things that are provided for in the contract. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Evans. What do we make off the good company a year now? Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Evans. I'd have to defer to uh, Mr. Sherman to be able to provide that information. I don't have it readily available as it relates to the franchise fees. Yes. yes. Yep. Mr. Okay. And, and also, what, what did um, we make off of um, waste management? Those two numbers, please. And I, I know Mr. Sherman's going to research that one. Any additional comments while we're waiting on that for the mayor? Just wanted to. I think that the uh, city attorney said that you know, if we reopen the contract, what does that look like? I want to see what that looks like. I'm not saying that we're going to go in and make you know changes or we're going to renegotiate, but I would like to see what that looks like if we were to go down that path. Okay. And um. If we had any other questions for the good company, I know uh, we're waiting on some information for the mayor. Well, um, uh, Chris, Willie, thank you. You guys um, are welcome to the city. We're excited for the service. We get calls every day. And because it's been a change in service, we want to make sure that we've just kind of continued to ask the tough questions, have the dialogue and discussion, and continue to push um, to make this the best city, the cleanest city. So thank you for the work that you've done. We're excited to continue uh, with the contract and move forward with it. So we just want to make sure that everything's being touched on. Thanks, sir. And Mr. Tracy, thank you for as well. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Yes, uh, again, Randy Sherman, Director of Finance. Thank you for giving me that, that two minutes. Um, last year, we made about $2.4 million was the franchise fee. And under the waste management contract, we were making about roughly about $1.1 million. So we doubled. Okay. So the franchise fee doubled uh, last year compared to what we were doing with waste. Correct. Mayor? Yeah, so I, I, I like to say, I think if we go back to bulk, that price drop, right? If, if we go back to bulk, picking up bulk trash, that 2.4 goes away. Mr. Chair, if I may. So, um, if, if there, so um, I'm assuming, Mr. Mayor, you're saying if we were to incur the cost associated with it, absolutely, that, that cost would be utilized to fund um probably additional crews and additional equipment to effectively uh we would go behind the good company to get those non-compliant piles or what have you i'm, I'm sorry mr chairman quick sure. response so for the first year of the contract the city ate all of those costs right. and if i recall correctly it was over three hundred thousand dollars i think by the time we paid for all those piles um you know, legal dumping and, and all those types of things. So, so that's where part of that franchise fee went last year. I, I do want to allow the, but sure. I'm, I'm going off memory. And if you think it was far less than that, then so, so last, if I may, um, last year, uh, we go, we go provide some information. Um, when the city paid directly for the cost of, um, non compliant pals, it was about $80,000 that the city paid. We'll reconcile. <laughs> we'll reconcile those numbers. Thank you. I just have a different yeah. recollection. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Thank you again to the good company. Thank you for coming tonight, Mr. Travisio. Thank you, guys. Board.
uh, we have appointments, uh, 6A. Would we be inclined to uh, table this to we have the full complement of the board? And I believe we also need to, um, Ms. Hall, have you received responses from board in reference to the email you put out? I received one response from okay. the board member. So I was thinking we could wait until the full complement of the board for the appointments. Mr. Evans, could we continue to have staff for this month uh, attend some of the board meetings and um, until we can actually appoint for next month? Mr. Chair, if I may. Mr. Evans. Uh, yes, we can We can certainly assist. One of the things I think would be helpful if the board can provide the clerk with the information concerning the advisory boards that you're interested in serving on. And then what we will do is those that are hopefully, you know, the board is unified on that and then we can put it on consent. Uh, and those those ones that need some additional discussions, if two or more members are ser interested in serving in, whether it's the uh, full member or the uh, alternate member, we can discuss those. Discuss those. So Good. We can we can do that. Thank you, sir. Are we okay with that board? Um, sorry, Miss Councilwoman Lanier. Um, why would we table it? Just because we don't have a full board? Is that what it is? Uh, we have to go through the full discussion tonight without the full makeup of the board. And I believe Miss Hall just said she only got one response to the email she sent yesterday. So, so can we do it that way, Chair? Uh, which way? Um, have us to send into the. Um, clerk what we wanted to be on so that uh, there, there are appointments and we can put them on consent at the next yeah. meeting so if we do just write in the responses to the email no you want to go with them tonight i don't want to send mine in no oh, i didn't okay. send it in on purpose okay um because that's something we discussed i don't know i didn't understand why it needed to be email oh we can we can have the discussion just for the, the sake of the sake of time and the full make of the board but we can have the discussion it was just a recommendation to go forward so if we want to have the discussion tonight i'm, I'm amenable to that board pleasure of the board Sure. I mean, I missed the what what you we were going to not do it because we didn't have the full board. makeup of the board uh, appointments were not sent in as of yet. Uh, and the consideration, I know I know it's 940 now to get all the appointments to go through them. I did not get was uh, Councilman McCoy one of the ones that sent them over to you. No. So I wasn't sure what boards he may want to sit on as well. Mr. Chair. Mr. Uh, Mr. Dr. Can, can can we put this off to the next meeting and uh, maybe members of the board can volunteer to show up at the meeting with the staff uh, any of these meetings until we make final decisions you volunteer to stay what do it uh, i think part of the discussion was uh staff was going to attend the board meetings for last month until we set these appointments and then this month doing the same thing until we set the appointments at the meeting in may well, if most of us are still on the board currently, the same people can do it. I know there's some Dr. Botel was on, so I can understand those not, but some of the alternate, there were alternates. So the whoever's the alternate can go. Um, I'm fine with not selecting anything tonight, but I won't be emailing mine in. That's something we need to talk about. Let's still have the full discussion. Okay. Chair, so that means that we just can't continue the way we are in terms of- we can, we can actually go, it was a recommendation. We can go through and just go through uh, appointments tonight. Uh, recommendations tonight with the board and um, go from there if we choose. Uh, yeah, I, there's only uh, the one that I attend, uh, which is tomorrow morning at nine, is the uh, TPA board. I wanted to continue that way, but I also wanted to, um, I also wanted to serve with the Palm Beach County League of Cities uh, general members. I've been in, involved heavily with that uh, group. Uh, not even as an uh, alternate, but as uh, just showing up to the meetings and getting some information. So that would so, be the only change for me. So, board, do we want to just go through them now? We'll go through all the items now. I'm fine with waiting to the next meeting. Okay. Because I'm okay with going we waiting to the next it's meeting. It's well. 9:38. Correct. I'm okay with waiting to the next meeting. Dr. Spiders. Okay. Next meeting. Okay. And. Councilwoman Lanier, I know you made one recommendation for TPA and tomorrow. Of course, we can still attend the meeting as of tomorrow. And any of the board meetings, uh, we can go, especially if you've served in the capacity of regular or alternate. Um, but at the next meeting, we'll go ahead and have the discussion. Um, okay. Chair, I just wanted to make my recommendations or request known to the clerk so that she knows that's the only one that I was concerned about. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Councilwoman Lanier. A day. Ordinances on second and final reading, item 8A. Ordinance 
4250, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Rivera Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida, substantially amending Chapter 19, Traffic and Motor Vehicles, to create a new truck route procedure which authorizes the City Council to establish areas in the city where certain truck traffic is prohibited, to create a new citywide parking administration system and enterprise fund, which systems rates and fees shall be set by resolution of the city council, to add new and clarify existing parking regulations throughout the city, creating new municipal beach area parking regulations and park parking regulations for city parking garages, creating a new parking enforcement procedure, creating a new towing, impounding, and immobilization process, removing provisions which are outdated and or no longer enforced, and for other purposes, providing for conflicts, severability, codifications, and an effective date. Mr. Chair, we do have one public comment card on this item. The acceptance of public comment cards is now closed. Motion no doubt. Motion been made. Second. Properly seconded. Mr. Evans. Mr. Chair and members of the board, at, at this time, uh, we'd like to bring forward the ordinance concerning uh, parking, and then uh, Ms. Christy Goodell will be making the presentation. Chair. Uh, Council Millennium. This is second and final reading. Um, do we need to go through the entire presentation? What? I'm okay with Ms. Cadeau just hearing the changes uh, between first and second reading. Okay. Is that okay with all the board? That's fine. Just hit the changes. Okay. Hey, Ms. Cadeau. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Mayor, and, and council members. Uh, Christy got on behalf of the City of Rivera Beach presenting on second reading the amendments to Chapter 19 uh, to develop your, your parking ordinance in essence. Uh, it does also address operation of motor vehicles and other issues, but parking being the primary reason that we're here tonight. Um, on first reading, the recommendation of City Council, the motion to adopt on first reading was to remove sections 19-77 uh, through section 19-81, which were some new uh, parking regulations. Um, we removed those from the ordinance for second reading, and so those are, have been deleted. There's two versions we provided in the backup, a clean version, uh, which is just standard format for an ordinance showing strike throughs and underlines. Um, the easy read shows the deleted provisions, just in case you want to read to make sure that we deleted all the provisions that were requested. Um, that was done. The remainder of the ordinance remains intact, and I'm happy to answer any questions or concerns you may have. Let's go into public comments. Kendrick Wiley. Welcome, Mr. Wiley. How are you doing? Hi, everybody doing? My name is Kendra Wiley. So I want to start off first, but give great, um, give praise to God for waking me up this morning and having me come to this council meeting. I think the city is really missing this, beginning about all the things that God do for us. So I just want to get his praise for um, asking my question about the concerns about this parking. So line 643 of 19-7075 Massimo Parking Timing states that no person who owns or possess or control any vehicle should park vehicle on any street or any highway of the city more than a period of 60 hours. So my concern about this is what the provision of homeowners be able to move the vehicles? What is the due process in this? And what about homes that don't have driveways or garages? Because a lot of homes in Beach were built with no garages. So where should they park their car? So we'll go back to uh, line 1186, Division 6, Reinforcement Section 19-104, saying reinforcement. What this state is, wherever a vehicle is deemed violated, the city parking reinforcements will penalize the residents. So this is one of my biggest concerns. What's the guarantee that to the public that the parking reinforcement actually is going to attempt to identify the owner before the car get towed. An incident happened in my neighborhood seven months ago that police officers came and impound numbers of cars 
with no due process. Imagine you come home from work from a stressful day and you had a long day, you come home, your car is gone. You don't know somebody stole it, but when you finally got impounded, um, you gotta use money that you gotta pay your bills with to get your car or just lose your car. So that's said, imagine that. So what is ensure that this, this don't occur again? So in another thing, how does it impact small businesses? And did the city ask the business owners of Ocean Walkway about this ordinance um, number 4250 on businesses? And my last question is, what is the physical location of Ocean View Retail versus Ocean View Beach Premium in Marina Lot North and South Free versus Marina Sand Lot? What's the difference in these? And again, did we assault the business about this ordinate number 4250 um, about these concerns? Thank you. Thank you for coming, Mr. Sweller. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chair, that's in the public comment for this item. Thank you. Comments from the board? Mr. Chair. Doug Smith, go ahead. Okay, I, I have two concerns with this ordinance. Uh, I want to ensure that uh, the residents throughout the city have access, free access to the marina area and to the beach area uh, on Singer Island. It's very important that we don't permit private developers or even the city to develop parking, uh, which will basically price out the community from using the uh, facilities in these areas. Uh, that's number one. Uh, number two, I think that we should include in this parking ordinance that if any private developer is building a, a parking lot that will be available to the public, that a certain number of those spots be made available above and beyond the zoning code uh, for free. I know we do that in Lake Park. I happen to be doing that right now on a project. Uh, in their ordinance, they require 10% uh, additional parking to be made available to the public. Uh, free of charge, and they are responsible. The developer is responsible for maintaining those spots for eternity. I think we have to make sure that these concerns are included uh, in this ordinance. I've also received numerous complaints uh, from constituents with respect to the boots being put on the cars. People do not want boots put on, on their automobiles. So if we can uh, home in on these concerns that I have, I'd be more than happy to support uh, the rest of the ordinance. Thank you, Dr. Spiders. Additional comments from the board? Yes. Ms. Millison, go ahead. Um, within the price range, um, not range, the rates that are listed, it does allow residents, I'm sorry, it does allow people to have the first two hours free i did notice on some of it so if someone's going to the beach if they're going to be out there for three four five six hours um they just get the two hours and then they have to pay for the others i know most municipalities i've never seen or at least i'm not aware of residents having um discounts because i know we talked about this um before and if you can remind me as to why we kind of got away from that was that you, Mr. Evans? <laughs> Mr. Chair. Mr. Evans, go ahead. It's always me. Um, <laughs> um, so when, when we looked at this particular ordinance, we looked at a couple of things. We looked at uh, a situation whereby, you know, we can provide for resident passes. We looked at a situation where you would make the first two hours free. So for all intended purposes, somebody was going to a restaurant to eat, you know, they'll be in and out in there. And so they wouldn't see that. Um, and then we had to look at a situation where, you know, a lot of our parks and a lot of our, you know, beach area, we did receive, you know, some monies from the state and the federal government. And so when you do create different or alternative pricing structure, it becomes a problem. It'll be something that can provide for, you know, a situation whereby if the residents came and they were just coming to conduct business, go out to eat at the Ocean Walk or at the marina, they have two hours. And then it wouldn't have a situation where the businesses would have an issue because most of their clientele, they would want their clientele to turn over in every two hours. And so that's that's how we landed on that particular situation as to what the what the numbers are uh, as it relates to, to parking. But we looked at 
what would be a situation where the residents and the businesses probably wouldn't have any issue as it relates to to opposition. But I, I know from running a parking operation in another municipality, one of the concerns that you do hear is when you do go to a business, if you're charging parking, the businesses say right off the bat before somebody buys a grouper sandwich, it costs me two or three dollars more. And, and that was an issue that the business community had. Um, also, um, in that same community, there was a situation whereby you did acquire a resident pass. So you would go, you would pay five dollars for the resident sticker, you would provide your information, then you would be able to be able to park at all the lots free of charge. And so, you know, we've had discussions about those particular uh, elements. Um, but when we did get to the point where if you gave a situation where residents park for free, um, there there is some issues with regards to some of the grants that we've received for the purposes of the expansion at the, the marina as it relates to the docks, as well as at the beach, some of the grants that we received as a result. So that's where we landed on on that option. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Mr. Dr. Spiders, go ahead. Okay, so, uh, Manager Evans, uh, I worked in two cities where we had the same situation. One of them was the actual city that was the Supreme Court case that ruled because federal funds and state funds were used in a project. We could not charge differently for, or could not be substantially different for out of town is as per residence, but we were allowed to charge a lower fee for residents. Uh, so the way we got around this was by uh, allowing outer town is and residents to buy uh, monthly and uh, yearly passes to all our parking lots. Uh, usually the outer town is did not take advantage of that system, but we did charge a lower fee uh, for the residents. Uh, but as long as we weren't substantially different in the in the fees, we were allowed to charge lower fees for the residents. And we could do that for everybody, really. And as I said, the residents are the ones that usually take advantage of that, not the out-of-towners. Additional comments? Um, Madam Clerk, do we have any public comment cards? No, we only have that one public comment the one? card. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, Ms. if I may please, uh, speak to the mobilization portion of the ordinance uh, to Councilman Spiritus' comments. Please, let's go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, there's, there's two provisions in the ordinance that deal with immobilization devices. Uh, one provision deals with city enforcement and after three un or more unpaid tickets, the city's authorized to put a mobilization device on a vehicle. Also, if a vehicle is parked without a um, license plate or a um, unclear VIN, then it can be immobilized because obviously you can't issue a, a traffic citation or ticket for it, parking ticket. The other one is on private property to allow private properties to use immobilization devices. Um, and the whole goal of this ordinance was to really create sort of a, a shell of a sort of overall parking system. So what I would recommend is if council is uncomfortable with the mobilization, I would recommend tweaking this version to require that a resolution be passed by council to authorize immobilization on public property. That way, until it becomes an issue and you need to use a different enforcement tool, you don't have to use the immobilization portion of this ordinance. But again, it's really to give you sort of a tool belt of options that you have on how you want to deal with parking enforcement. So that would just be my recommendation. We can make a minor tweak to require staff to come back for city council approval to start immobilization if there seems to be an enforcement issue. Chair, please, please go ahead. Okay, I, I understand what you're saying, but you know, part of the problem that I've experienced over my years, and I'm older person, is that the uh, the worst case scenario is on the private property uh, for the boots, and that's where you get most of the complaints, not from your local police department. So I think that we have to consider the entire 
uh, use of, of boots on cars and immobilizing cars. I have a problem with that. The constituents have come to me and made that very clear that they have an issue with that. So I, I would like to see that handled. I also think that we really have to come up with something for private developers that are building uh, private parking lots that they're going to be making money on to ensure, especially at the marina area and at the beachfront area, that we provide a certain number of spaces to the public. Uh, and two hours really isn't enough. Usually when a family goes to the beach, they're there for the whole day. They go to the, use the restaurants, they use the beach, uh, they use the volleyball, whatever. They, they're there for more than two hours. Um, many of our residents cannot afford to do that on a, on a, every weekend. It could be very costly. So I think we have to come up with something, even in a mixed-use building, because right now you're talking about charging for parking. Someone who builds a mixed-use building can be char charging for parking. Uh, I think a certain number of spaces should be made available above and beyond the zoning code uh, for the public, similar to Lake Park's ordinance. No comments from the board. Madam Clerk. Councilperson Lanier. Councilperson Miller Anderson. Yes. Councilperson Spiritus. Oh. Chair Lawson. Yes. That item passes with Councilperson Spiritus dissenting. Item 9A. Ordinances on first reading, item 9A, ordinance number 4259, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Riviera Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida, amending the City Code of Ordinances, Chapter 31, zoning on behalf of Second Avenue Properties, approving a rezoning amendment application to rezone a plus or minus 0.1127 acre parcel located at 30 East 22nd Court and a plus or minus 0 0.1466 acre portion of 2230 Broadway from a single family dwelling district to a downtown core zoning district provided for applicability, conflict, severability, and codification and providing for an effective date. Mr. Chair, we do not have any public comment cards for this item. The acceptance of public comment cards is not closed. Motion no doubt. So moved. Second. Motion been made and properly seconded. Uh, before we go into the item, uh, I just noticed the time is 9.57. Board, do we want to make a motion to, uh, to extend the meeting? So moved. Second. Motion been made and probably second. Do we want to make that time sensitive or till the end of the agenda? Mm. The agenda. Motion been made to the agenda. Is that second still stand? Mm. Reluctantly. Yeah. Sorry, what? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Madam Clerk, we'll take a uh, motion to extend to the end of the agenda. Councilperson Miller Anderson. Yes. Councilperson Spiritus. Yes. Councilperson Lanier. Yes. Chair Lawson. Yes. Unanimous vote. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Evans. Mr. Chair, members of the board, if I get a director of planning and develop or development services, uh, Mr. Clarence Sermons to make this presentation. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Uh, good evening, um, Mr. Chair, uh, members of council. I am Clarence Sermons, director of development services for the city. The item before you concerns the rezoning of a small parcel of property located at the approximate location of the red dot on the screen before you. A closer view of the properties in question is now on the screen uh, with the parcel in blue and lot 128, uh, the subject of the rezoning before you this evening. Looking north from Broadway, you can see uh, portions of the property from the view on the screen before you now. Now looking at East 22nd Court from Broadway. And now you can see the property and parcel in question to the right of the image before you, which would be, again, the properties here and here. The applicant is requesting approval of rezoning to include a approximately 0.1127 acre parcel located at 30 East 22nd Court 
at the PCN already read into the record, as well as a approximately 0.1466 acre portion of 2230 Broadway uh, at the additional PCN that's already been read into the record. The existing conditions are a existing parking area. The existing zoning is RS8, which is single family residential. And the future land use is currently downtown mixed use. On the screen before you, in red, you can see the two parcels subject to the rezoning request before you. And now, the image shows what the zoning would be if the item before you is passed today. Currently, the area in pink is zoned downtown core and the yellow is RS8 and the applicant is proposing to change these two lots to downtown core to be consistent with the existing use on the property here. So staff analysis has covered two primary areas, whether this request is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan and with the existing and proposed land use development regulations. Staff has found that the rezoning is consistent with the comprehensive plan in the following areas, including a comp plan area uh, or policy 1.8.1, policy 1.2.21, and goal 1.3. Before this hearing, this item was properly noticed according to state statutes and city ordinances. Staff received three communications in favor of the proposed rezoning. Staff recommends that city council approve uh, this item based on the following findings of fact. The proposal is consistent with the future land use element of the comprehensive plan. The proposed amendment is consistent with the land development code. The Planning and Zoning Board uh, reviewed this item and recommended that City Council approve the item, and staff also recommends that City Council approves this request. That concludes the staff presentation on this item. The applicant is here and present uh, to present if uh, desired by the board. Thank you. Comments from the board? Oh. No. no public yeah. comment cards? Yes. Comments from board Ms. Millions, go ahead. Um, I, I did ask a question in regards to the current parking along the north side of the building. Uh, Ms. Jacobs, I know that you were supposed to go over there. You or someone was going to go over to that location and see if that is uh, city property or is that um, BOW's property. Are you remember that conversation, Ms. Jacobs? Yes, and if, okay. if I may respond. All right. uh, okay, you Mr. weren't Chair. on the call, so I didn't know if you got involved or not. If I may, Mr. Chair. Sorry, Ms. Go ahead. Yes, uh, uh, Assistant City Manager uh, Jacobs did brief me on the concerns there, and uh, the uh, south side and the north side of the street are in an area of the city um, where there is um, a shortage of public parking. Uh, so there is parking that is uh, taking place in the right of way, and the understanding is that the parking is not causing an issue with um, emergency response vehicles being able to get through and traverse the area. So to this point, it hasn't been a public safety concern. Uh, for other properties, not the one in question, uh, we have had conversations about potential redevelopment in the area. And when uh, those properties are redeveloped, that uh, additional public parking be included. Uh, but right now, we do believe that this proposed rezoning would provide additional parking in the area and address some of the issues there. But does that get to uh, what the question was uh, previously? Uh, no. The signs that are up there, it says that if you're not going to BOW, your car will be towed. So the question for me was, where does these T-shirt people park? Be and is that BOW's parking? area or does that belong to the city the parking area on east 22nd court is what is associated with the applicant before us i, I believe the uh, the t-shirt business is the next block over and 
not affected by what's being proposed here. And the reason I'm asking, and I do understand there's two different streets we're talking about, but with making this change here, will that provide them with additional parking where it will free the other stuff up? This particular ordinance, no, I don't believe so. It would be private parking on the private property of the applicant. And unless there is some type of agreement with this property owner and uh, the one in question, I don't believe it would be just openly available to them. No, I, I don't think you follow me. Okay. If this is approved, BOW is going to have additional parking, right? Correct. Okay. If that is the case, will they still need the parking area that they are using on the north side of their building? I believe that would get to the applicant and their parking needs, so I will defer to uh, their council on that. Do you okay. mind if I pull up an aerial so I make sure we're yeah. discussing the same thing? Mm -hmm. And Mayor, council members, I'm Lisa Revis of Beckham. I'm Lisa Revis of Becker and Polyakoff, and I represent Second Avenue Properties. Is it coming up, Mr. Sermon? How do I make it come up now? When you say to the north side, the property that we're rezoning is outlined in red there. Our existing parking lot is immediately adjacent to the west. Are you talking about the parking to the north of those two parcels? Yes. That's not our property. That's owned by um, Billets. Oop. Billets. So where the traffic light is, that is what street, where the traffic light is? Traffic light. On Broadway, what street is that? 23rd, 22nd, where the traffic light is? That new traffic light? Which is just north of BLW? It's not on 22nd. I think it's further north than 23rd even. Mr. Chair, if I may. <laughs> I was able to bring up an aerial. So the the block near uh, the T-shirt um, shop owner, I believe is what you mentioned. The street north of them is East 22nd Street. And then a block north of that is East 22nd Court. So we're, we're two streets away from where that business owner is and where some of those parking um, issues have been brought up with some street parking being occupied by a different business owner and uh, there being um, some concerns from the t-shirt store owner of where his um, customers may park. So it, it, that is two streets away. It's not the street that's been in question from my interactions with that uh, store owner of um, where their uh, clients can park. Am I making any sense? <laughs> I don't. Um, so I'm not talking about the same business because okay. they have two sections, right? BOW or am I confusing this whole thing? Two sections? No, two buildings. So. This is not the... the. Um, no, we, we do not have two buildings. We have one building. Maybe I'm confusing that. Okay, well, I was just trying to see if there would be some kind of resolve to the parking. If they were getting additional parking, would that help out on the other side? But if you're saying these are not the same people, which I don't think I'm confused, but I can't really say tonight. <laughs> Mr. Chair, if I may. Go ahead, Mr. Evans. Um, one of the things we could do, Councilperson, bef between now and second reason, we can take you out to the site and go out there with staff and, and have that conversation out there to ensure that you know we can look to address your concerns before this item comes back for a final reading. All right, that'll work. Thank you. Did you want me to do a presentation on what my application? Board, did you want to see the application? Yes, a presentation. Go ahead, man. Um, yeah, as I said. 
not changing. It's not working. Mr. Sermons, how'd you get this to move? Oh, I have the wrong clicker. It's true. Uh, Mr. S Doug, I'm sorry, Dr. Spirit, let's go ahead. Uh, I, I don't need a presentation. We can pass on that. I just have one question. Go ahead, Dr. Spirit. Uh, counselor, uh, would your client be amenable to uh, building about a 10 foot landscaped area between the residential building next door? My client will, will comply with the code requirements for a buffer, yes. I don't know off the top of my head what those are. Mr. Sarmis, can you tell us what those code requirements are? I can take a look. I do know that our landscape code does have requirements for adjacencies between commercial and residential, which would apply to this situation. I don't know the exact buffer width and the nature of the required landscaping within it, but it is a part of our code. That's very important to me. Thank you. Additional comments from the board? Thank you. Madam Clerk? Councilperson Spiridis? Yes. Councilperson Miller Anderson? Yes. Councilperson Lanier? Yes. Chair Lanza? Yes. Unanimous vote? Thank you. And thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Regular agenda uh, item 11A. Resolutions on regular agenda, item 11A, resolution number 54-24, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Riviera Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida, authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute a three-year master agreement between Lexipol LLC and the City of Riviera Beach and Riviera Beach Fire Rescue for policy and procedures, creation and ongoing maintenance of such policies and procedures in the amount of 107000 two dollars and 42 cents and providing an effective date mr chair we do have one public comment card on this item the acceptance of cards is now closed so motion be made do we have a second second motion be made and probably seconded madam clerk i'm um, sorry mr evans mr chair members of the board at this time i'll ask fire chief john curd to make this presentation uh, he's working in collaboration with human resources director bartley who is ill and cannot be present this evening but uh, Chief Kirk will be making the presentation. Chief. Thank you. Welcome, Chief. Thank you, and uh, good evening, Chair, Council, City Manager Evans. Um, this was a project that was born out of the fire department. Uh, the fire department has not updated its rules and regulations since 1992. Uh, we also have outdated SOGs. So as we were looking to enhance our rules and regulations and bring them up to current, we started to run into some obstacles with some of the rules and regulations that exist for the city and HR, which have not been updated since 2012. So we found ourselves in a dilemma where our newly revised rules and regulations would then conflict with the city's rules and regulations. So after consultation uh, with HR and their team, uh, we met with Lexapol and Lexapol provides not only policies, procedures, rules, regulations, and guidelines for public safety entities. They also provide this service for municipalities. So this was a great time for fire and HR to bring all their policies together so we're all singing from the same sheet of music. Um, this is a three-year agreement in which Lexapol provides us with policies that they have a repository of. And then what we would do is we would look at the policy and those policies would be customized for the city of Riviera Beach. They would look at any federal laws that would apply to the rules, regulations, and policies. They would look at state law. They would also look at any litigation or case law that would affect it, ensuring that these rules and regulations are legally defensible. Um, so this three-year agreement 
um, would revise those rules and regulations, not only for the fire department, which does have rules and regulations outside of what the city's norms are, but will also revise all of the city's rules and regulations for our public works employees, our parks and recreations employees, so on and so forth. Um, Lexapol will not only provide the policies for us, um, what they will do then is provide a repository for us to keep these policies, make sure that we can keep track of revisions of these policies moving forward. They will provide a mechanism for us to be able to distribute the policy to our employees, for our employees to acknowledge that they have read and received the policy, and it also provides training for individuals who may need um, refresher training, let's say, on a particular policy. So. Um, staff has met with Lexapol and we are seeking council's approval to enter into this three-year agreement. And I'll be able to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you. Question on the board? Mr. Miller Anderson? No, I just wanted to have the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller Anderson. Additional comments from the board? Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, if I may. Mr. Evans, go ahead. Uh, just one correction uh, with regards to, we, we did update a lot of our policies and procedures, I think back in 2022. Uh, but there are certain policies and procedures that we still need to update, um, especially even uh, SOPs within the respective departments. Uh, so to the chief's point, uh, there's a lot of uh, policies and procedures um, that are provided for. The great thing about this particular system too is once a policy is modified, it informs the employees of the modifications to the policy. There is also a situation where if there is a violation of the policy, and one of the corrective actions is to review the policy. There are quiz components that persons can take a quiz and you can tell if they've read the policy. And so it will be able to archive all that information. So you would be able to go in personnel files automated and see all the trainings that have been provided. So it is a very uh, critical tool and it will allow for us to bring all our policies and SOPs in line with what best practices are across the uh, state and across the nation for that matter. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Additional comments from the board? Madam Clerk? Mr. Chair, we have one public comment card. Thank you. I'm sorry, this is for a, a different resolution. My apologies, Mr. Chair and board members. Thank you. Councilperson Lanier? Councilperson Miller Anderson? Yes. Councilperson Spiritus? Yes. Chair Lawson? Yes. The unanimous vote. Thank you so much, and thank you for the brief time, Chief Kirk. Appreciate you. 11B? Item 11B, resolution number 17-24, resolution of the City Council of the City of Rivera Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida, authorizing, piggybacking the City of Delray Beach's contract with One Parking LLC under City of Delray Beach request for proposal 2022-038, awarding a contract to One Parking LLC to provide comprehensive parking management and enforcement services and authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute same and providing for an effective date. Mr. Chair, we have one public comment card for this item. The acceptance of the public comment cards is now closed. Motion to doubt. So moved. Do we have a second? Motion dies for lack of second. Madam Clerk. We are on item 11C, resolution number 3-24, resolution of the City Council of the City of Riviera Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida, establishing the rates, fees, and penalties associated with parking ordinance pertaining to the city's parking system, authorizing the city manager to amend rates from time to time and providing for an effective date. Mr. Chair, we have one comment card on this item. The acceptance of the cards is now closed. Motion no doubt. So moved. Second. Motion been made and properly seconded. Ms. Evans. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, if I can have the finance director, Mr. Randy Sherman, to make this presentation. Welcome, Ms. Sherman. Good evening again, Randy Sherman, Finance Director. Um, yeah, 
was this was the right one. Okay, so item 11C, uh, adoption of parking rights, is a companion item for the parking ordinance 4250 that you uh, just adopted. Uh, within that ordinance, uh, parking rates are to be established uh, by resolution, and this is the resolution 3-24, uh, uh, where staff is proposing certain rates. Um, we'll tell you that um, oh, wrong one. Sorry. I uh, will tell you that the, the rates that are provided were um, given to the city or, or suggested to the city by the city's parking consultant. Um, again, I you know have said on a few occasions, but I'll repeat it here. Uh, you know, parking and parking rates is more of a science. Um, the parking rates are intended to um, encourage the parkers to park uh, as you know the city desires them to park. You put higher rates. Uh, we would prefer shorter term parking. You're going to put uh, longer or lower rates uh, where you really want the uh, the intended parker to park. Um, these rates, as you notice, on uh, we've given two options here. Option one is the option that was um, attached to the resolution. This offers two hours of free parking at the Ocean View Ocean Walk area and um, two hours of parking at the marina that are both free. Um, the concept there was uh, to deal with, again, the issue that we are not allowed to do preferential rates for our residents. Uh, the two hours of free parking would allow our residents to go to the beach for two hours free or to go and use the restaurants for two hours free. Um, alternatively, option two, um, the proposal was just to put the zero to two hours at $2 at both of those locations uh, that were free. And staff was recommending option one. Again, it does provide some free parking, free access uh, to the city beach amenity and to the restaurants. And it would avoid uh, having to do validation for the restaurants. Uh, we had concern um, you know, that we didn't want to in negatively impact uh, the patrons going to the restaurants. So again, staff is asking, uh, or suggesting option one, but certainly, um, you know, staff is open to, to any changes or uh, or requests of changes from the council. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman, uh, do we? You go on to the next one, slide. I was going to. Please, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, and just again for comparative, um, you know, we picked out. Uh, some other communities around us. Columns on the left, the West Palm Beach. In the middle, you have Deerfield Beach, Pompano Beach, and on the right side is Delray Beach. So again, we were looking for all beach communities uh, or waterfront communities. And again, as you notice, um, you know th these rates are not going to match up dollar for dollar. Um, it's dictated again what each one of those communities wants the parkers to do and where they would want those parkers to park. Um, you know, I'll point out, for example, in West Palm Beach, the zero to two hours is a dollar. It's actually a dollar for the first hour and the second hour is free because they want people to stay downtown. You know, so again, everyone, you know, creates their, their own uh, rate structures, again, to kind of, you know, use that financial motivation to get parkers to park where they want them to park um, and uh, not stay any longer than they really want them to stay so they can turn over uh, the parking rates. Uh, but I, again, I will go back to uh, the two options that, that we have um, for Riviera Beach. Any business slides? 
No, is that it? no, that's, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I will take any questions that you may have. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Evans. Do we have any public comments, Madam Clerk? We do. We do have one public comment thank card. You. We'll take the public comment first, guys. Mary Graham. Welcome, Ms. Bram. This is Mary Bram Rivera Beach. I do like option one. Uh, I'm, and I know I put a card in there for A, all both of them. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to run it because it is, we're getting a little bit late here. But I do like option one. I know I was down to a restaurant uh, down on uh, uh, Clematis there. And uh, for two hours, I paid $5. I do believe in a sunset. And I'm so glad that we are establishing some parking in this city because we need every revenue penny that we can acquire with the things that we are on conference and doing with the city. So we need to gain revenue in every corner that we can. So this parking here is an institute for the city. And I do like option one because from zero to two hours, hey, we get free. So so at least that's giving us something back too. On holidays, those big holidays, no, no. We need to we need to gain that revenue because that's when uh, the majority of tourists comes, uh, you know, everybody comes in into the city of Riviera Beach. So if we are to establish the parking, let us think about some of the sunset time and you all, which you all do consider uh, the holidays being that time. And option one, would I, I, could, I would see that would consider the city as well. And when we see, have this comprehensive management, there's nothing wrong with piggyback. Our procure, procurement department does not uh, delineate that we cannot piggyback on someone else. And I like the comparison, you know, from West Palm Beach, I think it was Delray and others compared to that option one. Uh, I, I, I like that. And, and if any, any changes that you all would like to have adjusted, you have to have somebody to oversee this here. So, so we have a good company in here to make sure that they know what they are doing and they are collecting all of this revenues so that we as a city can gain on it. Okay, and 11C, like I said, I'm just gonna say the rate fees, they are already established there. So I guess it's, it is left up to you all board to which one of the options that you all would like. But uh, in order to meet our city needs and as far as we as residents, uh, I do feel as if you know option one is giving something back and it's not too steep, but we must gain revenue in this city one way or the other. And as far as the manager, amending the rates and time, well, he's the city manager, but you, it could also come back to you all too. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, ma'am. Comments from Mr. Sherman? Options were part of the requested recommendation or questions from, uh, statements from the board. Mr. Chairman, Dr. Spiritus, go ahead. I still have the same concerns about pricing families that can't afford to spend $30 to come to the beach for eight, eight hours, uh, and then they go buy their kids an ice cream. It becomes a very expensive day uh, for families that can't afford it. I, I would urge the council and staff to look into other communities that do charge uh, a monthly fee or a uh, a yearly fee for parking uh, for residents and non-residents. You can charge a differential if it's not substantial. Uh, tourists are not going to buy a monthly pass or a yearly pass. That'll be really the residents that'll be doing that. And I think the residents deserve something uh, for all the development and the loss of the use of these areas, the marina and the beachfront especially. There's no comments from the board? Chair. Uh, Councilwoman Lanier, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I agree with the fact that, I mean, we need to explore some other options for 
uh, residents who live in the city. But at the same time, um, the city of West Palm Beach, I went to a, a transportation planning authority meeting. It usually cost me about five bucks to park for like two or three hours. Apparently there was a event like, a, I wanna say the boat show. I was charged a hundred dollars and 40 cents to park. So those are kind of like, you know, we have to find some middle ground and will that even affect if there is an event in the city? Um, because they definitely got, uh, you know, have hundred dollar parking for events in West Palm beach. And I know we're not, you know, exactly like West Palm beach, but we do have to charge something, um, in terms of trying to get some revenue for the city. So I think that we can look at the residents uh, in terms of, I like the terms of a monthly or yearly pass, but we have to have some type of concessions for people who live in the city. I agree with that. So Mr. Chair. Um, Doug Spears, go ahead. Yeah, I, I make a motion to amend this resolution uh, to ask staff to look into other options uh, for monthly or yearly uh, passes for the residents uh that meet the state and federal requirements second motion been made and probably seconded additional discussion mr evans i know we've had that conversation about um residents uh passes and uh giving some type of reprieve to the residents what was the uh, outcome in reference to uh legally being able to charge a difference between uh residents and non-residents and I know that you uh, you spoke about this in, in uh, a previous county where you implemented parking. I know we've had that discussion. I just can't recall tonight. Um, Mr. Chair, you, you can you can certainly do it. Um, the, the hard part is really trying to pin down what is amenable to the board with respect to is it two dollars? Is it four dollars? Is it yeah? So that that's the is it a you know prohibition that says you know, residents can buy a parking pass for $5 and they can get access to all uh, all parking lots. You know, we, we can do that research um, and, and ensure that it's in compliance, but it really is kind of what the what the pleasure of the board is with regards to this. Some communities have it to where you buy a parking decal and you have to do that annually and you pay for the cost of the processing of the decal or you have a situation where a couple hours are free. Uh, so whatever is you know, the pleasure of the board, we can come back and, and the clearer the board can be to staff with respect to what your desired outcomes are, the more refined we can be in, in what our approach is. And then of course, for legal sufficiency and then reaching out to our granting agencies and finding out, you know, what uh, what we need to do to stay in compliance so we don't have to remit funds back. I would be inclined to option two, uh, which is paid parking from the first hour. Um, every, every area that I've gone to, they've, charged a um they charged me to park uh in downtown area and beachfronts but i would be uh, amenable to looking into the resident parking pass with an annual fee uh where they cover the cost of the decal and they come in and register for it uh annually so at least covering the cost of the decal um at first i wanted to just charge for parking because we need to generate revenue but i i hear dr spiritus's concerns and i also understand that we are looking to increase across the board when it comes to uh, utility district when it comes to um, uh, the water rates. So I want to make sure that we can give them some type of reprieve. So if they want to register annually, that gives us the option for them to come in, register their decal, and then have free parking as resident. Mr. Chair, if I may. Sir. Uh, we, we do have uh, the, the pleasure of having Ms. Godot here. Um, and so she has pretty extensive experience in, in another municipality that may have some some insight to share with regards to this issue. So if the board would indulge, I, I think it would be good to to hear what Ms. Godot has to say concerning this particular matter. Thank you. A little overtime, Ms. Godot, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Manager, um, um, Chair and Council again. Um, yeah, we ran into this issue in Lake Worth Beach um, when they redid their uh, beachfront casino area um, they received a FERDAP grant uh, to do part of that project. And with the FERDAP grant from the state of Florida, um, one of the requirements is you have to maintain the same rates, whether it's for residents or non-residents. The city of Lake Worth Beach had for years prior to this FERDAP grant 
a um, parking area just for residents that was at a reduced rate or a free rate for a period of time. So they were able to negotiate with the state of Florida and Palm Beach County because they had to get some county funds as well to maintain that. So what when this issue came up with the city and drafting the parking ordinance and talking about having a parking pass or that type of thing, one of the issues if you have grant funding is you've got to go back to those granting agencies and see if there's any leeway that you could provide a resident pass um, that's at a reduced rate compared to other passes. If the granting agencies are open to that, then it may be just a, a process of amending the grant or getting their approval in writing. Um, and, and so then you could do that to allow for that. And that's part of the parking ordinance to allow for that to be set up administratively, but doing that research to ensure, as the manager said, that you don't have to return any grant funds is key uh, to making that work. Um, to Councilman Spiritus's comment, again, you have to do also look at the um, equal protection aspect of this and to make sure that there's not a substantial difference between what you're charging but obviously you don't want grant funds to also be withdrawn. So a uh, couple of legal issues to look at. It can be done, but further research is needed. And to that point, I, I'm not sure or privileged to any information about grants that we've obtained for this particular um, parking so far, um, but I'm sure that would be something we'd have to take a look at once we got to cross that path. So, um, so Dr. Spirit has put a motion. It's been seconded by um, Councilwoman Lanier. Additional comments from the board? Ms. Millenison, go ahead. Yes, if you could get some municipalities that have the residence passes and just to get an idea as to how much they cost, you know, they're charging for those as well. If sure I can. Sure. Um, so on these comparative, um, I know, I don't know if it's, this is, is this One going to work or not? Resident 80. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Anyway, uh, West Palm Beach does have a monthly pass. Uh, they also have a resident pass, but again, there are no grants um, impacting these. Um, they're charging $100 a month, $80 for resident. Deerfield Beach has a resident rate of $100 flat. Um, Pompano Beach does $100, and again, that's a monthly rate. Um, they do have a resident eight month rate. So again, that's gonna take care of their, their seasonal people. Um, so again, they, they are doing, I, I can't speak whether they all have grants or, or do not have grants, uh, but those are the types of fees that, you know, that they're looking at. Now, again, that may be more, again, I'm not sure where that is. If that is five day a week parking versus I go to the beach you know, once a month or, or whatever. Uh, so again, it, it's not necessarily apples to apples, but again, just to kind of give you a, an idea what, what the other communities are charging for and a permit. To that point, I think that there's, um, we also have to look at, we have to look at different uh, agencies, different municipal governments, but also look at specific areas because we're talking about our beachfront, our marina, which will be more comparable to like the Lake Worth Beach, which would be uh, comparable to those types for the marina uh, with the retail and beach and taking in consideration that uh, it's hard to compare with like West Palm who has a complete downtown built out. As we grow our downtown and we continue to expand on that, of course we can address and talk more about the parking in different areas when we bring parking garages and park street parking as we grow. But as of right now, I think to cover the, uh, or to start with the paid parking in the marina and the ocean front, I definitely want us to charge from the beginning first hour and then give some type of reprieve for our residents. And then just come up with a comparison. Yeah, and, and again, I would I would um, support that only because again we were looking to assist the residents with the free parking um, in option one. If we're going to deal with the residents in Something another apart. fashion, as proposed by Councilman Spiritus, then option two. We probably should go with option two because again, that won't impact them in the- I'd be in more inclined to option two uh, so that we can actually give that support, but finding out what the cost would be for those residents so that they can do those passes, come in and register, and then uh, go with option two, because a lot of the tourists that come, a lot of visitors that come from out of town, they utilize our amenities in our community, they have no problem paying for that first two hours. Mr. Chair. Dr. Spiders, go ahead. Well, I'm concerned with 
the future restaurants that'll be coming to the marina area especially and the restaurants that are at Singer Island right now. Uh, if you charge for parking and it may seem insignificant to you, people will pick another place to go to have their lunch. If they have to pay, you know, five dollars or ten dollars to have uh, to spend an afternoon at uh, at Johnny Longboats, for example, they, I guarantee you they're going to go to Duffy's where they can park for free. Uh, we don't want to scare uh people from using our facilities as well so I, I like the option one where they get the first two hours so at least they can go to a restaurant go in and out and and leave okay if if we as a board were supporting that option one then i would want i would want it just to be free for everyone without the resident pass because if those first two hours are going to be for everyone to just park for free whether it's residents or non-residents i don't want to also have the residents free have the tourists free and then have no revenue generated. We have to start generating revenue for the city. So that would be my concern with that. So if we're going to go with option one as a board, I would say not to incorporate the parking passes for the residents, is my opinion. Sure. So, well, we could good. also, you know, I, I'm more concerned about the residents, uh, but certainly if we could work something out with the rest, restaurants where they can get some sort of discount uh, to so their customers can come in and use it and they'll pay a fee. I know we talked about that as well. That was another conversation in the agenda review in previous. If, if we go with option two, we would deal with the validation program for the restaurants. So. Board, um, would we be inclined to looking at a validation, a parking pass, and going with option two? Because they still get support for the restaurants. They still get some type of validation so that they can alleviate the parking, still get the support, but then we also still generate revenue across the board, especially for the beachgoers. Because the beachgoers are the ones that we want to, this summer, we want to make sure that we uh, generate some revenue from the beachgoers. Yeah, but, but what are my concerns, man? I, I, we have, I'm first getting into this discussion with you now, but you got like a bait store in the uh, Ocean Mall. Uh, someone comes in there to buy, you know, bait, you know, for five minutes. They have to pay to park to go in there and just buy bait. No, we actually have some of the parking spaces have like free 15 Temporary minutes, 15. 30 minutes. So again, yeah. you can run in, grab your sandwich and run out. Yeah, okay. that okay. type of thing. Yeah, 7-Eleven there. I mean, right. people aren't going to go to 7-Eleven. Correct. Have to pay, right? Right. right. So on the premiums on the ocean's front side and then next to the stores, I'm assuming that we'll have a couple of uh, temporary, like 15 minute free. Well, uh, on the... Yeah, you're right. On the east side. Yes. Okay, so really the ocean front side, that's the premium rates those are the premium rates yep. that's why we don't want people to park long term Understood. that's why those rates are a little bit higher no it'll actually be on the on the west side of on the, the west building. side so as you come in 15 minutes so they can right. run into the 7-eleven the bait stores Mr. Doug's right to say grab okay. your yeah number two number two I agree mayor mayor supports option two um and I would be in agreement with Dr. Spirit is some type of validation option two but then also a parking pass for residents so then Mr. Chair Go ahead. Then, then I amend my motion to be uh, option number two yes, sir. Uh, with the discounts and the validation and uh, to ask the staff to look into the uh, resident passes. Do we, does your second still stand, uh, Councilwoman Lanier? Yes. Thank you. Additional comments from the board? Good. Madam Clerk? And Mr. Evans, does that give a uh, clear enough direction? Thank you, sir. Madam Clerk. Councilperson Spirit. Yes. Councilperson Lanier. Yes. Councilperson Miller Anderson. Yes. Chair Lassa. Yes. Unanimous vote. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Sermons. Mr. Sherman. And Mr. Sherman and Mr. Evans, thank you for this. Uh, we've talked about this parking for a couple of years now. So to finally get it implemented, uh, we're, we're very appreciative. So thank you so much. 12A. Discussion and deliberation. Item 12A, discussion and deliberation. Update on disposition of city-owned property conveyance to the Riviera Beach Housing Authority for the development of affordable housing. Thank you, Ms. Evans. 
Mr. Chair and members of the board, uh, the intent of this presentation is to provide you an update with regards to the discussions that the board has directed us to have with regards to the Housing Authority concerning the disposition of property, um, more specifically uh, 251 uh, 11th Street and then uh, the properties concerning uh, the 11 scattered lots throughout the city. Uh, Ms. Godot has been provided authorization by the board to proceed forward with utilizing uh, some public monies for the purposes of facilitating a review of the development agreements. Uh, originally, it was contemplated that this item would come before this board for some action uh, for this particular item, uh, but Ms. Godot will give you a status update with respect to the conversations and discussions and what is being done and what has been done and, and what will be done in the future. So at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to uh, attorney Ms. Christy Goodell. Thank you, Mr. Evans and Ms. Goodell. Yes, good evening again. Let me just pull up the presentation. Okay, good evening, uh, Christy Gatto on behalf of the City of Riviera Beach. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, members of the council, Mr. Mayor, um, this is to provide you with an update of the status of the city's development agreements with the Riviera Beach Housing Authority. Um, as you may recall, on uh, March 16th, we had a meeting here where uh, city council did pass two resolutions to authorize the surplus of city-owned parcels to the Riviera Beach Housing Authority. Um, that included the uh, property that's at 251 West 11th Street, the what we refer to as the Judge Rogers site, along with 11 scattered lots uh, to be developed for uh, single fam family homes. Um, the development agreements uh, we discussed were to be initially brought back to city council for tonight's meeting with obviously a deadline of April 10 so that they could be in the published agenda and that each council member would have sufficient time to review those. Um, since that March 6 meeting, we've engaged with a, a lot of activity to try to get those development agreements back to you within that time frame. Um, on March 12th through March 28th, as you may recall, um, the city provided city council with a survey to fill out on some of the key terms for those development agreements and also conducted one-on-one -on -one meetings. There was a meeting between representatives of the city and the Housing Authority to discuss some of the key terms. That was on March 13th, where the Housing Authority agreed to provide the initial drafts uh, for the development agreements. Um, on March 27th, we did receive those initial drafts of the development agreements, and the uh, city manager provided you an update the day after on um, some of the concerns with, we had with some of the key issues that were not reflected in those drafts of the development agreements. We then had a conference call with their attorneys to discuss those, um, and then further drafts were received after that point. Um, at this time, while we were looking at these drafts, as you may recall, uh, the Riviera Beach Housing Authority was also applying for um, county funding through their bond program. So we were also looking at additional documents that were being submitted to Palm Beach County. I did have to email their attorneys to get some clarification because there seemed to be some inconsistency with the information that we were reviewing. So what then happened was April 3rd, we got sort of the revised version from the Housing Authority for the Judge Rogers site. Their proposal that was submitted to Palm Beach County, again, had some different information than what was provided in the de development agreement draft to that date. Um, we then had a response to my email on some of the key terms that Riviera Beach Housing Authority was not agreeable to in those development agreements. Um, those are highlighted on the screen here, which then sort of led us back to another meeting uh, between the attorneys to discuss uh, some of those key terms on April 8th. 
Um, April 10th was when we heard that we would be getting another round of the draft development agreement. Um, and obviously, uh, representing cities, I do get concerned with giving things to board members with short notice to review it themselves. Um, so when I got the drafts, we had further discussions about the drafts on April 12th, and then we received um, word that we would receive the finalized drafts this week on Monday the 15th. Um, one of the conversations I did have with Hope Calhoun, um, who represents the housing authority in these development agreements, was to try to nail down some of these key terms that had been presented to council in their surveys and were not clear in some of the development agreement drafts that I was reviewing. This slide for April 12th reflects some of the items that we discussed. Um, obviously, uh, based on uh, that discussion, we then got the further drafts on April 15th from the Housing Authority. And on April 17th, you then were receiving additional information, uh, summarizing some information that again may have been not reflected in those development agreements or information that I wasn't aware of. So for me, one of my, my goals in getting you these draft development agreement is to get you a tight agreement where everybody's on the same page. We all understand the key terms and we all come together as partners to move this project forward because I've felt the sense of urgency to do this. Um, what I'm trying to do for the city is to protect what the majority of city council responded to in the survey. And, and these are what the majority of those responses said in terms of having a reverter on these properties for the city so that if this projects don't move forward, that the city can receive its assets back and protecting those assets. So if you do have to act on that reverter, you guess it assets back that are not encumbered with a mortgage or otherwise. Um, I also need to protect your desire as expressed in the survey to have a payment in lieu of taxes if the project's not going to generate ad valorem taxes. Um, I also see it's my charge to make sure that affordability is provided with the rental units for at least 30 years for the single family homes. We didn't have a clear majority, but I think the, the sense I got from the one-on-one -on -one meetings is at least 15 years, which is consistent with the county's policy. Also to get some more information about how the housing authority will be actually developing these projects in terms of their own financial audits, their performers to do this development, um, guarantees in terms of performance bonds when we get into construction. And these are the laundry list of things that I'm looking to protect for the city so that when I come back before you with these finalized development agreements, I can say, this is the key terms and this is what we're recommending the city to enter into. Um, so this is my next step to make sure that these development agreements turn into something that protects what we've heard from council to date um, and to ensure that you get this affordable housing in Riviera Beach um, and if not, your assets are otherwise protected. So I'm happy to answer any comments and questions you may have. Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Spears, go ahead. Councilor. Uh, you did receive the development agreement from the Housing Authority today? The draft, the latest drafts I received were on Monday. Um, mm -hmm. Today, we received some additional information through the city um, about a summary of some of the developments that's going to occur. Didn't necessarily match up with the draft development agreements I received on Monday. Go ahead, Mr. Chair. So, of course, what things didn't match up? Can you be more specific? Um, well, it, uh, one of the things, as you know, is on the Judge Rogers site, right? The um, development agreement provides for the housing authority to develop it, develop the project. Um, 
the information I received today was that the community center will be owned and operated by um, the, the Alpha Foundation. Now, that's not represented in the development agreement whatsoever, and we were informed previously at the council meeting that the eventual owner of that project will be paying, will be a for-profit entity that would pay ad valorem taxes. So it's kind of, for me, a moving target. And I really require, in order to do a development agreement to protect my client's assets, uh, what I'm looking for is a full understanding of how this is going to be developed. So in that development agreement, we're going in as partners and we fully understand what each other is doing. Are there any other conflicts or that you have to work out with the housing authority? If the housing authority has entered already um, any kind of uh, operating agreements on these properties or have entered any kind of financing agreements on these properties, we obviously need to be aware of that. Um, I've received conflicting information about that. So I need to have a full understanding of how they plan to develop in order to write a development agreement so we're all on the same page. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Wood, Councilwoman Lanier, go ahead. Um, I think the question for me at this point is how are we going to move forward from this? Now, I wish that you were the attorney for the Marina deal because we got a $10 million piece of property, uh, no performer, no financials, um, 99 years, a dollar a year, um, and nobody showed anything. So. With that being said, I understand the position of the city to make sure that that doesn't happen again. But what we don't want to do is put this in a position where it can't get done. And I understand that we have to protect our assets by any means necessary. But I also don't want to be in a position that we lose this project and lose this momentum to get this affordable housing. Um, other than our water, that is what we need the most in the city is place that people can live that they can afford. So I want to know right now, why is it that we have not moved any further than this? Now, I understand that, you know, you responded to them, they responded to you, and it's kind of back and forth, and you need more clarity. I get all of that. But I really want to make sure that we don't lose this deal. And I say that because there are other parties that are involved with this. There are other you know, financial developers. There are other people who are, you know, you know, would say, you know, oh, don't deal with Riviera Beach because they change their mind and they uh, they take too long and you know, and we just do not want that kind of funding to be able to be lost because we could not come to some agreement. But I understand your position in making sure that we're covered. I really do. But I just want to make sure that we can move forward as fast as we can. But making sure that we are protected but it just seems like a lot of back and forth and that needs to stop we just need to be able to to get to say this is what we need this is what we that, that you are supposed to give us and that's that i don't like all this back and forth and you know we're just kind of like dragging this you know down the road and what happens is that when that happens you know people walk away and we do not need that to happen with an affordable housing uh, project that is within our grasp. So we really need to make sure that we can move this along in such a way that we get this project done, but we also protect the assets of the city um, at the same time. So I, I really just want to see this project get to a point where we can vote on a development agreement and we can move this thing forward because I do not want other partners to drop out because of our reluctance to move this thing forward. Mr. Chair, if I may respond. Ms. Goodell. Yes. So what I what I think is happening now is is the narrowing in of the key issues. And my charge is to take the, the majority of the survey results, take their latest drafts, and try to redline them to say, here's this, here's what the city needs. Here's what we need at a minimum to move this forward. Um, and I agree 100% with you. Um, 
one of the things we discussed most recently that is my understanding is the housing authority is moving forward with a survey of the Judge Rogers site because that development agreement is going to carve out the Boys and Girls Club lease premises. So the city retains that, retains being the landlord of that lease. That survey will not be ready till sometime in May. So that gives us a little bit of time because we can't convey the property until we have a legal description to convey it based on it. So that's going to give us a little bit of time. My charge is now is to get them back revised draft with your key issues decided and move it along. Mr. Yeah. Chair. Uh, go ahead and finish. Uh, one more thing. I, I just really want to say that um, I do not want to lose out on this. Um, we're very close to getting this settled. We're very close to um, having this move forward, but I just don't want people to walk away from the table because we can't get it together. So whatever we need to do uh, to be able to move this along, you know, be clear about what it is that you want. They'll respond and we can kind of move this forward because even after all of this, there's still a long way to go in terms of getting this thing done. So, you know, the more we, you know, kind of drag our feet, the longer it takes for us to even put shovels in the ground. So I just don't really want to lose this momentum. And I'm hoping that at our next meeting, we have something to vote on. Thank you, Mr. Doak. Dr. Speed, sure. go ahead. So, Councilor, can't we do a development agreement that has subject to a survey carving out certain parcels, the Boys and Girls Club, to the satisfaction of the city? We, Mr. Chair, if I may, go ahead, Ms. we can do a development agreement that does that. The, the draft that I have right now provides that within 10 days of the effective data development agreement, we will convey the property. So just making that provision, we have to go in and, and revise other things because you cannot convey a property until obviously we get the legal description that carves out that property. If we convey the whole property, then obviously there needs to be a discussion with the Boys and Girls Club because we will have to assign the lease to the River Beach Housing Authority. And I'm not sure if any conversation has been had with the Boys and Girls Club about an assignment of their lease. Um, so that's why it seemed the easiest way to deal with this would be to have a survey so that when we, the city does convey, that portion is carved out. But can't we add that the uh, the assignment won't take place until that's completed? Absolutely. Right, but we can do a development agreement subject to all of that happening, and that the official assignment won't happen, the transfer of the property won't happen until they've completed the survey and a new plat plan. Absolutely. You, you can do a development agreement that's subject to them giving building permits for what they want to develop. So we could do a development agreement that says we will convey you the property once you get all your entitlements and once you have your building permits and you're ready to proceed with construction. By that time, they will have a survey that will carve out that portion of the property. They'll have their site plan approval, their replat, and their South Florida water management drainage approved. And so you, you're absolutely correct. You could do it in a number of ways. I'm working off of drafts that they've provided. So I'm trying to figure out a way to accommodate some of the things that they're requesting, but at the same time, protect the key responses I've received from council. Right, but I think right now, excuse me, Chair? Go ahead, Dr. Spears. Well, I think the concern right now that you have is the Boys and Girls Club. Yes, correct? that's that that's part of it for that Judge Rogers site. Yes. Right. So I, I don't understand why we can't do a transfer subject to it won't won't be complete until the survey is complete and a plat plan is filed. That, that that's that's another way that we could do it, correct. They've they've Riviera Beach Housing Authority has been wanting the conveyance ASAP. Right, and that would put the ball in the housing authority's court, not in the city's court anymore. Correct. Thank you. Council Melinda, go ahead. Um, this about the plats and stuff, I think I'm just hearing it day. 
it seems like every time we come to the table, it's additional stuff. And that's fine. But it seems as if this is moving so slow. And I understand that they have to get stuff to you. You got to get stuff to them. That's good and fine. But I just do not want, and I'm going to say this again, we cannot miss out on this opportunity to be able to move this affordable housing project um, forward. So whatever we need to do to be able to do that, I think that we need to have something time certain in bringing a development agreement back to this council. And I'm saying it has to be at the next council meeting because we have to move forward. And I understand there are a lot of moving pieces to this. It really is. I mean, I, looking at the, um, the deal, it's a lot of moving pieces. And I understand that you're doing the best that you can in terms of protecting the city um, the best way that you can. But I also at the same time want to ensure that the city does not miss out on this opportunity. So the time certain for the next meeting, which is May the 1st, is where we need to bring an agreement back to this council and vote and so we can move forward. And Mr. Chair, if I can ask a clarifying question, if the next meeting is May the 1st, then for purposes of publishing your agenda to have this in there, what would be that deadline? April, 20, April 24th. So if, yeah. if, what is the date? Next week, one week from today. Okay. It was that April 20. Okay, that's the date. Dr. Spiritus? Mr. Chair, so we, we, can, we can publish it, and if everything isn't complete, we can just delete it. Mr. Evans? Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, with regards to the, you know, I think it's in, important to, to realize that, and I think the board knows that, that this is a significant uh, transfer of property. And so staff is going through the due diligence process. And if you can see on the timeline, it's literally every day or every other day that staff is working to help facilitate that. So I can rest, you can rest assured that there is not situation and circumstances where the staff is holding up or providing any obstacles we are going specifically off of the survey information that was provided to staff for the purposes of resolving or putting forward the, the opportunities or the items that you were contained in the survey. So I just want to make sure that it's not a situation where the staff is being obstructionist or, or, or trying to stop the process. We're trying to facilitate the process and accomplish what the board is looking for. But when we get documents and information, it needs to be we get documents and information from one source, one time, and that's it. Because what's happening is we're reviewing things multiple times and there's different iterations. And so what's happening is it's just belaboring the, the, the point versus a situation where we can get in and review the document once and then kick it back for the purposes of returning. But in order for us to get the information posted by the 17th it requires everybody our partners included to provide us the information in a timely fashion so we can do what we need to do to allow for adequate time for this information to be posted and published nobody wanted to put something on the agenda as large as this that wasn't appropriately vetted and didn't go through the internal review process so i, I do want to make sure that we're, we're clear is we when we did have this conversation we had every intent to come back with the 17th and staff did ask actually for additional time and the board set the date for the 17th but it requires everybody working in unison from both parties parts to be able to facilitate that and i just don't want a situation where it's perceived or conceived that it's staff that's holding these things up because staff is processing these items as soon as we get them for the purposes of getting it. And we also need to get all the information so we can help put the agreement together that the board wants to see. So there's no misunderstanding with respect to what the relationship is, who's the funders, you know, what we're looking to bring forward, what's the consistency of the development. If, if you look at the, the process, we've been very deliberate in that and we've moved very quickly with respect to the process. So I, I just want to make sure that if we're going to 
um, move this needle forward. We definitely need the situation where the board does support the staff as well as the, asking the development developers to help provide us that information when we ask for that information in an expedited fashion. Chair. Uh, Dr. Spirit, is he finished? Uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, CM Evans, I appreciate everything you're saying and I'm sure the staff is working diligently and I'm sure the Housing Authority staff is also working very hard to meet all of the city's requirements as well. But I think I agree with uh, Commissioner Lanier. I think we have to put an end to this once and for all. This has been going on for months and months. And I think, the, as, as the Commissioner stated, times are changing. Interest rates are going up. Funding is going to be much more difficult to get. Uh, and I think that we can't put this off anymore. I think that two more weeks for staff and the housing authority to work out whatever the minor uh, problems are right now with the development agreement. I think you've been working back and forth right now. I think, right, you've been working with the housing authority staff and uh, and their counselor with Hope Calhoun. You've been uh, working with her? Mr. Chair, yes, I've been working with Hope Calhoun. Yes. Okay, so I think that in two weeks we should be able to have a development agreement here, and, and I think that we can publish it. And as I said, we can delete it from the agenda if we don't have everything that staff is satisfied uh, that we'll need. Uh, as the uh, commissioner said, and Lanier said, uh, we approved development agreements at the marina, uh, which is a much, much larger project than this, and we don't know where the funding sources are coming from a good portion of that project. And I think we have to treat this. We know where the funding source is coming from this project. And I think that we have to move forward while while we have the ability and the funding is still there. Thank you, Dr. Spirit. Is Councilman Lanier? Well, I was just going to say the same thing. I, I always bring up that marina deal because, <laughs> because that's $10 million in land and we have no idea what the funding is. And that's been eight years. So I don't want this group to be penalized for that. Um, I understand, as I said again, that the staff is working diligently and I support the staff wholeheartedly, but I do not want to miss out and I don't want to, can I, can we hear from Hope? I don't want to, to, to um, put ourselves in a position where we can't move forward. You know, people have dug in and yeah, I don't, I don't want to get to that. So can I hear from you, Miss, Miss, Miss Hope? Good evening. Um, Good evening, Scott. Mayor and council. Um, I heard a few things that I just want to address very briefly, and well, I before, just... Before we go into that, um, Council Millennia, did you have a specific question for Ms. Calhoun? Yeah, I wanted to ask the the uh, items that um, Dr. Not Dr. Well, Dr. Godot um, said uh, and, uh, to us for her to address those issues that she's talking about. And you said there was two or three of them that you heard. What were those? Uh, well, what I was going to address was a little bit different than what what uh, Ms. Gatto said. If so, I'm not sure if you want to repeat your questions and I can answer them, but or can I just just go? Okay, go. thank you. Really quickly, so um, I do have a great deal of respect for Ms. Gatto and her abilities and everything she said, and I look forward to continuing this process with her. But I will tell you, a part of her presentation proves the importance of she and I communicating. Um, regularly as opposed to information sometimes just being presented to the council. Because for example, she advised you that the survey for the Judge Rogers site will be ready in May. And she told, told you that information because that was the last conversation, that was the last information I gave to her. But that's been updated. So we will have a survey next week. So Council Member Spirit is to your point, we could have avoided all that conversation about subject to and can we, if we had just had the opportunity to speak and have that conversation before you got a PowerPoint presentation that I wasn't aware you were getting. So um, again, I think the point was made that if we could just communicate and get some things answered, we could move this forward quickly. Um, I just want to also point out a couple of things. Remember, we're talking- Ka I'm sorry, Ms. Calhoun, and, and I do understand um, Councilwoman, we do want to hear from Ms. Calhoun, but I, I don't want this to kind of be a discussion where we're interrogating and, and cross-referencing what was said and what was not said. I, I believe that the item was brought by staff to just present the information status update. 
the concerns that we currently have is that this is not being done in an expedited fashion. So I think we just need to give that clear direction to staff so that we can get this done. And I believe my colleague did say by next week, um, that should be feasible to get this done. As Dr. Spiritus did say, um, this can be given to us after the fact, uh, as long as we have it before this meeting and it's been agreed upon and recommended by staff. Um, I received an email from the housing authority this morning and I wasn't sure what was the details and, and dynamic behind the development agreement, the impact fees. I, I wasn't understanding why was this was sent to us, but my concern with this is I want staff to deal with this. I want them to get it done. Councilwoman Lanier, it is 11 o'clock at night and we're having them going back and forth. We're not going to do that tonight. And I'd prefer just to tell staff, have this done by next week so we can get this done if that's okay, board members. So Thank if you. I may just really quickly, so we are scheduled to speak on Monday after she's had a chance to thoroughly review what I provided, I guess, get me her comments or red line. And then we're talking on Monday. So hopefully by the end of next week, if neither of us has anything else going so on. So we're, we're looking, Mr. Evans, to put this on the agenda for May uh, 8th. And then that should give us enough time to get everything. No, first. Oh, I'm sorry, May 1st. Thank you. Doc. Thank you, um, uh, Attorney Dr. Wynn. Dr. So <laughs> everyone's <laughs> doctors tonight. May 1st is going to be when we'd like to have this back before us and that will give uh both of our uh, councils enough time to be able to prepare review and have the development agreement also taking some of the recommendations from dr spiritus with incorporating this into the agreement if we can go from there okay and can i ask hope if you can send us an email telling us the date you expect the survey that would be helpful too um, so i've been told by uh next week so i can as soon as the surveyor knows and gets it and it's not a science but by the middle of next week Thank you. And to Mr. Evans' point earlier, we, we want to make sure that everyone's working on the same page. So if we're just staying in constant communication and getting everything in a timely fashion, uh, because we understand this is housing authority's number one priority, we also know that city and city staff is working on a million things as well. So we want to give enough time to get this done, but this is our priority to get this done with you guys, um, because we're not just working with developers, you're partners. This is the Riviera Beach Housing Authority. So we want to get this done in expedited fashion as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank you. Any additional comments from the board? Thank you. <clears throat> Mayor, good. Comments from the executive director? I'll, I'll run with it. <laughs> um, Mr. Chair, uh, just so the, the board and the community is aware, we have a job fair on Monday. Uh, so encouraging people to join us at uh, Manatee Lagoon in Riviera Beach. Um, so the parking lot is in West Palm Beach, but Manatee Lagoon itself is in Riviera Beach. So um, any problems in the parking lot will be handled by West Palm Beach and any <laughs> issues will be associated with West Palm Beach. But we're excited, um, encouraging people to uh, apply. Please apply for the positions that we have available on the website. If you qualify for the positions, you will have an opportunity to interview for the positions right there on the spot and possibly leave with an offer. So we are excited. Uh, to have some of our partners with us. Uh, Palm Beach State will be there. Good companies will be there. All your departments will be there represented. Um, so looking forward to uh, to hiring a bunch of great people and bringing them on board uh, for the team. So certainly excited uh, with regards to that. Um, also, you did receive some correspondence from me this evening about uh, some uh, gas line work that's going to be um, being done throughout our community. So we're going to be utilizing our communication uh, tools to be able to inform the community accordingly with regards to that. And so it is not the city doing the work, but we wanted to make sure that the residents are aware of the work that's happening in the community. And then we did have a uh, successful redistricting meeting. Uh, we had about 60 plus participants. Um, so I will be sending out an email to those that attended the meeting that and the board will also get that email that provides the PowerPoint presentation, uh, the city's charter, the ordinance, uh, that speaks to redistricting and Walter is going to be airing the redistricting meeting on uh, channel 18. Also, we will uh, be providing information to you all once we receive the three maps that are provided by the consultant for the purposes of redistricting. If anyone is interested in information concerning redistricting, we would just ask that they contact the city manager's office. And certainly once we get to a point uh, where the maps are presented to the board, uh, we will facilitate some additional community conversations prior to second and final reading. So, uh, Mr. Chair, that concludes my comments for this evening. Thank you, uh, City Manager Evans. Attorney, when? 
No comments, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman Lanier. Um, I just want to say briefly that um, when we talked about that water initially, and I don't want to go back and forth with that, but when we talked about the water issue, um, the last meeting or the conversation that when the mayor came and we had this investigation and we had the press conference, and it was the same meeting that I talked about Mr. McCoy's harassment of myself, and then I get a, a text from someone says, are you more concerned about your safety or about the water? And I said both. I'm concerned about both. So when you start delving into people's background, because I know Virginia Baker doesn't have an engineering degree, you know, whether it be from utilities to animal control. So I didn't mean I didn't I didn't I wasn't looking for that. What I was looking for was an update about what was happening because we're going into another year and that happened back in June. So I just wanted to put that out there because this is not about one particular person. Of course it is about the process, but who is supposed to be uh, you know, doing the process, so to speak. So that's where I was going with that. And uh, those are my comments. Thank you. And did, any committee reports before we continue? Dr. Spiritus, uh, comments? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm looking forward to a resolution of the light poles on Singer Island that are on private owners' property. And hopefully we can come to a resolution soon over this matter. This has been going on for years and hopefully we can put an end to this. I would also like to recommend that the city look into having a forensic audit so that we know exactly where we stand in, in all our accounts. Thank you, Dr. Spiders. Councilman, uh, Councilman Lanier, I'm Miller Anderson. I have none. Thank you. Mayor? Good, sure. Okay. Uh, Mr. Evans, just a few quick comments. Uh, union conversation. I know that we had closed session for police. Uh, we had representatives from fire. Um, if we can get this resolved immediately, it's just whatever it takes to get this done. I know we're, we're pushing back and forth, and I know we spoke earlier about the, the police uh, discussion, but uh, being that fire just recently announced an impasse, if we could just work on that, making this priority to get this done. Uh, disparity study update, if we can get that on the next agenda in May, just to get an update on where we are. And I believe that's all of them. Police, fire, and our conversations you did announce in via email May 8th for a p potential meeting. Did you want to discuss that tonight just to get clarity from everybody? Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, with regards to the email that I sent out, I believe today, um, I wanted to get uh, clarity from the board if you were in favor of pushing the CRA's meeting till the end of the month to facilitate um, the presentation from the top three firms for the Riviera Beach Police Department and the Riviera Beach Fire Department. Um, we would like to bring those um, entities, those teams in front of you for the purposes of you ranking uh, and selecting who your number one ranked firm is for those particular uh, proposals. So if the board is inclined to do that, staff will spin up and um, be able to get that ready for you. But I needed to see if the board would be amenable to that. I know we'd have to give enough um, notice to the team. So I'm OK with May 8th, because uh, that's typically a CRA meeting, cannibalizing that to have discussions about police and fire presentations. Board? So that does that mean that we, we're going to still have a CRA meeting at the end of the month? Mr. Terry, yep. yes. Yes, you still will uh, have a CRA meeting. Yeah, um, there would be I, the 28th. Mm, no, I got a problem with that. Oh, too many meetings? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's a meeting every every Wednesday. And then, too, we have other issues that we are uh, housing authority issues and and uh, all kinds of stuff happens. So, no. Mr. Chair, if I may. We can do it the same. Well, I don't know. Well, I think the concern with, the, uh, with Mr. Evans is that uh, we're going to have presentations and each presenter is going to have about 30 minutes. And if we're doing both items uh, and we're going to hear uh, what three, three, three uh, presenters um, on each item? Uh, Mr. Evans. Yes, the recommendation would be three uh, presentations on uh, from the three teams on each of the items. And, and May is a five Wednesday month. Uh, so it would be a situation where uh, we would have the regular city council meeting on the 1st. The 8th would be the meeting where you would discuss the an ultimate set special city council meeting on the 8th. 15th would be the regular city council. 22nd will be um, CRA. And then um, since it's the 5th Tuesday, 5th Wednesday, you can have that Wednesday off. 
<laughs> and then we get a summer break, as Mr. Evans yeah. said. We get a little summer vacation. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Is that written in stone? I, I, I did send out an email um, that saying that I would like to give the, the board, if they were inclined to, uh, consider a, a a summer break from I think it's June seventeenth or June maybe June eighteenth to July seventeenth, so a little bit of time off uh, for the for the summer. Hey. Yes. Go visit my parents. Please. <laughs> okay. Yes, so we agree to that right now. <laughs> <laughs> but to that point, uh, how are we looking for the for the May? Then I know you said that you're concerned with that, Councilwoman Lanier, but that's four weeks in a row. But no, I'll take that with the break. With the summer break. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right, perfect. Fair so enough. then we can go ahead and move forward with that, Mr. Evans. Perfect. Uh, yes. Thank you. Good. Sure. Dr. Spiritus, good with that? Okay. Thank you. Additional comments from the board? Okay, with no further business, meetings adjourned.